Thank you very much, uh, Rufio. Uh, good morning, uh, colleagues. Good morning in Asia. Good evening in uh, Washington. Uh, thanks for joining that late. It's great actually to reconnect as a community of practice, uh, of treasury, uh, but virtually uh, this time after the meeting we had in Moscow in October. So we were supposed to meet in Mongolia and we were supposed to meet in Laos, be Laos these days, uh, but COVID decided otherwise. So we thought that um, now that you have managed to extinguish the fire, and I really want to congratulate the uh, PEMNA members for their efficacy in doing so, uh, it is a good time to reflect and share experiences on how uh, treasuries have dealt with the COVID impact and the COVID response, which was very forthcoming. Um, because COVID really brought a triple disruption, right? a disruption on revenue streams, affecting directly sales tax, uh, the stay at home orders, duties through the closure of, uh, of border and disruption of trade, uh, but also SOE revenues uh, coupled with an oil and gas uh, price collapse. The second disruption is an expenditure disruption right? with increased emergency COVID expenditures and relief actions increasing debt, uh, and obviously treasuries are in the middle of it as they have to balance uh, the revenues and expenditures and manage the cash shortage and the borrowing. But you also have to deal with a third disruption, which is an administrative disruption, as the health measures and prevention also applied uh, to officials. And so while you had to stay home or work from home, you also had to ensure business continuity uh, to make sure that the rest of the government still functions and the citizens and firms get the essential services. So uh, we're really amazed um, with uh, what tr how Treasury has responded to this challenge and wanted uh, to hear from you, uh, your experience uh, from the, uh, the battlefield, but also what lessons uh, we can learn uh, for the future, right? How we can make Treasuries more agile, uh, more resilient, <clears throat> Uh, before the next crisis strikes. So we'll have a very a rich agenda, um, spanning over three hours of discussion, starting with some opening remarks by Mrs. Dang Thi Tui, uh, whom I don't need to present anymore, uh, one of the most uh, active members of the TCOP uh, community and kindly acting as the chair of the community. <clears throat> then we'll have a presentation by Kuram Farouk, uh, who is the author of a paper on agile treasury operations and has done a lot of thinking um, about how treasuries have been impacted globally and responded. And I think this will give us a, a global picture, which can be quite useful uh, for the uh, further discussion. Um, we'll, then we'll go, for this we'll cover around one hour, we'll have a question and answer series. And uh, let me reiterate what Rufio said. So please <clears throat> do uh, use the chat function to post your questions, to raise your hand, so that we can have an active participation of all the members. Then the second part, <clears throat> sorry, the second part will uh, then provide a deep dive in uh, three country experiences. Uh, Myanmar, uh, Philippines, and Vietnam have kindly agreed to share their stories and, and their responses. Uh, and again, the, uh, then it will be followed uh, by a quick Q&A session, and maybe hopefully a tour de table would really be good to hear from everyone. Before we move to uh, Dr. Ho, the head of the PEMDA Secretariat, for some closing remarks. So we have, we're fortunate uh, today to have a good crowd and excellent speakers. So just a couple of words of introduction of the speakers. I think everyone knows Mrs. Tui. Uh, she has uh, 30 years of experience at Treasury. Uh, we have very wealth of experience at the State uh, Treasury of Vietnam, uh, but also was the project manager of IFMIS. And I think uh, this, um, the PubMIS system was certainly a very useful tool to ensure business continuity, and we'll, we'll certainly hear from her. Uh, Mr. Karan Farouk, uh, a senior public sector specialist at the World Bank with over 25 years of experience on working on public financial management, treasury, and IFMIS both in government and around the world, uh, will share his global experience. 
then from uh, Myanmar, Ms. Do Kin To, uh, the Deputy DG of the Treasury of Myanmar, has kindly agreed to share uh, her experience and response. She also has a rich career at the Ministry of Finance, but also as former general manager of a state-owned bank. And I think that's a very interesting perspective as well, because we know that state-owned banks and SOEs were at the forefront of the government response. Um, now she's in charge of cash and debt management, which uh, is certainly not easy in the current time. Um, then we have a presentation uh, by the Philippines by Mrs. Amo Dai, um, the Chief uh, Treasury Operation Officer, who's in charge of asset management. <clears throat> and she will actually share her perspective on the financial impact of COVID and on the market and how that constrained also a bit the Treasury response, <clears throat> which has to ensure business continuity, but also calm the market. Certainly not an easy time. Uh, we'll have uh, two presenters from Vietnam. Mr. Huyen Bhutan, who is the Director of Corporation at the Vietnam State Treasury and a very active PEMNA member, familiar to many of you. She has over 20 years of experience in Treasury, um, including also on the TAPNIS, TAPNIS project lead. She's a computer science engineer, uh, which uh, it also helps in reflecting how systems can be strengthened going forward. Uh, Mr. Huang Buite is the director of IT at the Vietnam State Treasury. has been managing all its information systems and ensuring business continuity of the go all government during crisis. So it will also be interesting to see then what it means for the future of treasuries and their modernization. So with this very rich panel, we really hope to have a lively knowledge exchange and discussion. And without further ado, uh, let me hand over to Mrs. Tui. Thank you very much. Xin cảm ơn ông Fabian với cái lời giới thiệu. Xin chào buổi sáng tất cả các quý ông, quý bà. Mrs. Thủy from Vietnam. Um, thank you, Mr. Fabian, for your introduction. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Trước tiên thì thay mặt Chủ tịch TICOP, người ngày Tổng Giám đốc Kho Bạc Nhân nước của chúng tôi, ông Tạ Anh Tuấn, xin được chào mừng tất cả các quý vị đã có mặt tại các điểm cầu tại các nước thành viên của mạng lưới của chúng ta để tham dự một cái webinar với nội dung rất thời sự của thế giới là ảnh hưởng của COVID-19 đến các chức năng lõi của Kho Bạc tình hình tế và các giải pháp ứng phó của chính phủ. On behalf of the TCOP chair and VST Director General, Mr. Trần Anh Tuấn, I would like to extend my warmest welcome to all members participating in this webinar to discuss one of the most well-timed topics today, impacts of COVID-19 on core treasury functions, actual situations and government responses. Chúng tôi cũng rất vui mừng thấy rằng là các đồng nghiệp của chúng ta tại cái cầm đây, điểm cầu ở đây, nhìn chúng tôi thấy rằng đều rất khỏe mạnh. À, các uh, thành các nước thành viên của trong mạng lưới của chúng ta đều đã thể hiện khả năng kiểm soát, kiểm soát đại dịch uh, tương đối hiệu quả và hẳn là uh, các cơ quan kho bạc của chúng ta trong thời gian qua đều đã duy trì vận hành tốt các cái chức năng nhiệm vụ của mình với một hiệu suất cao. I'm also glad to see that our participating colleges today are all in good health. The member countries of our network have proven capacity to effectively control the pandemic and that our treasuries have been able to maintain our efficient operations. Kính thưa tất cả các quý vị, kể từ khi đại dịch COVID-19 bắt đầu khởi phát tại Vũ Hán, Trung Quốc vào tháng 1 năm 2020, thì thế giới của chúng ta đã trải qua những tháng những tháng khó khăn và mất mát với hơn 6 triệu người nhiễm và trên 350.000 người tử vong. Since the COVID pandemic started in Wuhan, China in January 2020, the world has experienced unprecedented hardship and losses with more than 6 million infected cases and 350,000 deaths. À, đại dịch COVID-19 đã và đang tác động sâu sắc đến sức khỏe, cuộc sống của con người, gây ra nhiều tác động nặng nề đối với nền kinh tế, xã hội của tất cả các nước. Đồng thời là đại dịch cũng đã đặt ra những thách thức to lớn với hoạt động của toàn bộ xã hội mỗi nước, đòi hỏi sự lãnh đạo, sự phản ứng kịp thời và phù hợp trong với bối cảnh của từng nước của các chính phủ. 
The COVID-19 crisis has significantly influenced the human health and life, rendered serious economic, social economic impacts on all countries, and posed major challenges to all aspects of the society in each country. That would require strong leadership and prompt government responses relevant to the circumstances of each country. Đối với Việt Nam của chúng tôi thì là một nước có cái biên giới rất dài đối với với Trung Quốc thì, thì và cũng như nhiều các nhiều nước khác thì chúng tôi cũng đã nhận thức được cái sự nguy hiểm của dịch Covid từ rất sớm. Uh, uh, in Vietnam, we have a long border with China unlike many other countries. We became aware of the danger of Covid-19 from the very early time. Thủ tướng của chúng tôi ngài Nguyễn Xuân Phúc đã đưa ra một thông điệp cho toàn xã hội là chống dịch như chống giặc. Và Việt Nam đã huy động sự tham gia của chính quyền các cấp, hệ thống y tế quốc gia, các nhà khoa học và sự hỗ trợ của lực lượng công an, quân đội và kêu gọi toàn xã hội cùng thực hiện các biện pháp chống dịch và đã được người dân ủng hộ cao. As our Prime Minister, Mr. Nguyễn Xuân Phúc delivered the message fighting against the pandemic like a war. Vietnam has mobilized the participation of all government levels, our national health network, our scientists, our military and police forces, and all in the society to embark on pandemic control actions with full support from the public. Và cho đến nay thì Việt Nam cơ bản cũng đã có thể coi là kiểm soát được dịch bệnh với 293 trên 328 ca đã khỏi bệnh và 47 ngày chúng tôi chưa có ca nhiễm mới từ trong cộng đồng. As a result, Vietnam has basically put the pandemic under control by now with 293 out of 328 cases recovered and 47 days of no new affected cases within communities. Uh, in the context of the pandemic, I think that leadership in the Ministry of Finance of all countries have to face a challenging question, how to cope with the pandemic, with surging expenditure needs, to play the role of the government, to support citizens and businesses, and to mitigate economic impacts of the crisis, while not all countries have sufficient reserves of resources. Uh, as I said, you know, uh, uh, with all the new challenges, actions must have been taken while timely payments must be made for salaries, welfare entitlements, and other existing and highly prioritized expenditures. Why ministries of finance around the world have been trying to rearrange the raising and allocation of financial resources to incur and report on government expenditures in the context of special distancing, national isolation, disruption of commercial and economic activities. Từ đấy là có thể cho thấy rằng việc mà duy trì tốt các chức năng cốt lõi của kho bạc là rất quan trọng để chúng ta có thể giúp chính phủ đối phó với đại dịch một cách hiệu quả. It is evidence that the continuity of core treasury functions becomes extremely important for effective responses to the pandemic. Cộng đồng kho bạc trong mạng lưới Pemna của chúng ta với vai trò là hành nghề là cộng đồng hành nghề kho bạc, chúng ta cũng cùng luôn cùng học hỏi, trao đổi và thảo luận các cái khó khăn chung mà chúng ta đang phải đối mặt. Uh, Tico Pemna is playing the role of a treasury community of practice where we mutually learn, exchange and discuss the common challenges that we have to face. Và tôi cho rằng hội thảo của chúng ta ngày hôm nay là hoạt động rất kịp thời của mạng lưới để cùng nhau chia sẻ tình hình của mỗi nước, kinh nghiệm của cơ quan kho bạc, của các các thành viên trong việc duy trì hoạt động và đóng góp vai trò quan trọng như thế nào để hỗ trợ chính phủ triển khai các giải pháp ứng phó với đại dịch. I think that the webinar today is a timely action of the network 
for us to share the facts of each country and experience of our treasuries, of how to continue the treasury functions in each country and how to make important contribution to support our governments in the actions against the pandemic. Tôi hy vọng rằng hội nghị trực tuyến của chúng ta sẽ đem lại hiểu biết chung với với chung giữa các nước thành viên về các giải pháp để đối phó với uh, ảnh hưởng của Covid uh, tại mỗi nước cũng như là ảnh hưởng uh, đến các cái chức năng lõi của kho bạc mà chúng ta đang thực hiện và tình hình thực tế và các giải pháp của chính phủ trong khi để đảm bảo mà chạy vượt qua được cái đại dịch này. I do hope that this webinar will bring us mutual understanding and also knowledge of new measures to cope with the COVID-19 impacts on core treasury functions, the current situations and government responses. Thay mặt TICOP, à, thay mặt à, toàn hộ bộ à, các thành viên của mạng lưới của TICOP, tôi xin được cảm ơn ban lãnh đạo PEMNA, ông Fabian, các văn phòng ôn banh à, tại các nước thành viên mà tham gia hội thảo ngày hôm nay và đặc biệt là ban thư ký của PEMNA đã giúp TICOP tổ chức hội thảo này. On behalf of all members in TICOP, I would like to express my profound thanks to the PEMNA leadership, uh, Mr. Fabian Sedra, uh, uh, ôn banh offices in the region and especially the PEMNA Secretariat for preparing and organizing this webinar. Và thay mặt Chủ tịch TICOP, thì tôi cũng xin được cảm ơn các nước thành viên đã trong cái điều kiện bối cảnh là chúng ta cần phải tập trung cao cho uh, duy trì cái hoạt động của chúng ta trong uh, thời đại dịch. Nhưng các nước cũng đã rất tích cực để chuẩn bị và để chia sẻ trình uh, các cái kinh nghiệm của mình trong cái ngày hôm nay, buổi hội thảo ngày hôm nay. On behalf of the chairman, I would like to thank all the members uh, in the context of uh, focusing to fight against the pandemic. You uh, spend your time to participate in this webinar. Và cuối cùng thì tôi xin chúc sức khỏe tất cả các ông bà và chúc cái hội thảo của chúng ta ngày hôm nay sẽ được thành công. Without any further ado, I would like to express my best wishes to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, and to the success of this webinar. Over. Sau đây thì xin được chuyển lời trong phần. Thank you very much, Mrs. Tui, uh, for getting us started. Uh, and indeed, I think congratulations really to the countries in Asia for the very effective and proactive response. I think many uh, countries around the world can learn uh, from the Asian experience and are looking towards you. And so I think the, the knowledge uh, sharing from this uh, Tika uh, will be shared more widely afterwards. Um, it's, uh, I think, proactivity uh, and experience is really, uh, really key. And I think mean, that's something we'll also hear from uh, Farouk. Uh, so over to you, Farouk, if you can give us an overview of the global thinking and, and experiences uh, with this crisis, and in particular, the role of Treasury uh, during this crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabian. Good morning, colleagues. It's great to see you all participating. I'm actually very surprised to see you such a great, big uh, participation. I think one of the lessons that we have learned uh, in this is unprecedented. And one of the lessons that we have learned is to stay connected. If we want to defeat this pandemic, if we want to really overcome this, um, uh, this challenge, we need to stay connected. We need to stay connected in our work. We need to stay connected in our social relationships. And this is just fantastic. And I just want to congratulate Fabian and the Pemna Secretariat for organizing an event under very adverse circumstances. This must be very challenging, but this speaks to the strength of our work together. So I will put up my uh, presentation. So can you uh, can you see the screen now? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Carl. Yes. So I think that as uh, uh, Fabian and Mrs. Tree has set up the context, I will just be very brief. And then, but may, my main presentation will be around ensuring business continuity in general. But then uh, I will dig deep into the how various treasuries around the world, they have operationalized emergency arrangements for the core treasury function. That's where most of the discussion will be around. And then maybe some of the lessons that we should keep in mind when we move into the recovery and reconstruction phase, which are extremely important for resilience. Uh, as uh, I think I just, I, I can skip it. The most critical part for the treasury is to 
uh, see what are the most important functions, how to fast track fund flow to the right direction, and how to ensure transparency and efficiency. So this, with these questions in mind, we prepared, the bank team prepared a paper, and I was leading that team, and I will share with you the findings of that paper. So uh, basically, the strategy response could be organized around three main areas. One is the, how to internally coordinate and ensure business continuity within the treasury office. The second bucket would be operationalizing emergency arrangements or core treasury functions. And the third bucket would be around post-pandemic environment. So the first one, you see, every context is very different but the fundamental principles remain the same. So the first point is that uh, while uh, uh, treasury should be flexible, but the fundamentals of ensuring transparency and accountability is what matters. So the procedures could be different in Vietnam, and it could be different in Cambodia and different in Myanmar, but I think the fundamental financial management principles remain the same. So within those principles, good principles of transparency and accountability, each country has to devise its own specific response to the treasury in line with the good practice. So basically, the my main message is that we should be flexible, but in order to respond to the uh, pandemic. Uh, so how do you minimize the impact of disruption? I think the first order of the thing, which is most of the countries have already done actually, to constitute some kind of a treasury crisis management committee so that you have a consultative forum to make decisions. In many countries, I have seen that this is a kind of a loose and informal arrangement. But I think if you formalize it, I think it's better that it's more transparent and more accountable rather than having a just a loosely informal arrangement. And this treasury uh, crisis management committee should have a clear line of sight with the maybe there is a committee or task force within the Ministry of Finance and there is a cabinet level crisis management committee. So they should all be aligned. They should all be working uh, towards the same policy objectives. So line of sight and alignment is very important. And uh, the big challenge before uh, for this crisis management committee would be how to operationalize spatial distance. So most of the countries I have seen that uh, they have, uh, they were not prepared by the way. So they were not prepared, they didn't know what are the, there was not no business continuity plan, but uh, they were just in a reactive mode, responsive mode. So the first order of the day was that they prepared staff rosters in most of the countries because people did, uh, there was no arrangement for home-based work. So how to manage distance. Uh, so they, uh, for example, in Armenia, they developed staff roster. In Saudi Arabia, they developed staff roster. Saudi Arabia was better prepared because they had some online arrangement of electronic document management. Then system that they could extra, uh, access online and they immediately then uh, facilitated the uh, remote access to their uh, payment systems. Uh, but most of the countries, I think they were just struggling and uh, they prepared rosters and physically people were coming to the office. So some said that you, uh, this X number of people were coming for three days. The other uh, so some, in some countries it was on alternate days. But staff roster was one of the important thing that was done. I think uh, Armenia was one step ahead in preparing the staff roster. They did consider uh, women, for example, who had small children and other staff who had pre-existing conditions. So they, uh, during the staff roster preparation, they were uh, allowed to remain home and not come to office while the other staff were required to come to office. So all the, this arrangement should be based uh, to, do, to enable home-based work. Uh, and also, I think the succession plan is important because we have seen in some countries the top management, one of the, for example, critical member of the crisis management committee was also affected. So you should have some kind of a succession management plan for your most important IT person who is responsible for enabling all this home-based work and IT access. If he goes sick, and then uh, who is the alternative? So that is one of the important things that uh, internal coordination mechanisms need to uh, consider. On the communication, I think uh, absolutely important. Uh, communication uh, should be consistent, coherent, and fact-based because there is a lot of uh, misinformation spread by the social media. 
the and uh, communication should not only be about the treasury procedure but also about health issues because staff are uh, concerned about their health so i think uh, one of the lessons that we have learned is to uh, be the most authentic source of information which is the world, world health organization so whatever technical information staff is asking provide that use that as a source of information as a reliable fact based information and provide that information so and one of the consistent message in the communication should be that you do care for the staff safety and health and i think and also uh, do communicate with your stakeholders the uh, ministries and departments on behalf and especially the health ministry and departments whose urgency is extremely critical so uh, have a very communicative clear cut communication line and have one representative of the treasury communicating to the outside world so that you have consistent messaging rather than different people communicating different messages uh, similarly mo monitoring and iteration business recovery plan always uh, you have to learn you know you, because uh, things come and then you have some of the, you know i have seen some countries they have established whatsapp message groups so they get feedback constantly from the ministry this is working this is not working our payment has been delayed this and that so i think you have to constantly monitor your plan learn lessons and then reiterate basically be agile in your planning nothing is cast in stone we are working in a reactive mode so there are always opportunities to improve uh, and monitor uh, one important thing is to get the feedback if you want to improve and monitor and uh, one of the suggestion that we have made in the paper is to acquire a specifically feedback officer who proactively reaches out to the clients ministries and departments and ask them get the feedback and prepares reports and which is submitted to the treasury crisis management committee so that you have you are constantly learning and then uh, taking uh, doing improvements in an agile manner so <laughs> this slide talks about the core processes so it has four buckets one is the how to operationalize the critical business processes and business function the second is the cash management and fund flow the third is the payment processing and fourth the fiduciary oversight and responding on the legal provisions and the business continuity i think the most fundamental message is that whatever are the Uh, many countries have existing legal frameworks that define how you respond uh, to a crisis to so follow that framework you have to follow the rules of the game for example in caribbean countries there is a set rule that in in emergency all the existing treasury procedures are suspended and urgent treasury procedures are activated automatically So once the emergency is declared by the government, then the the regular treasury procedures are suspended in Caribbean countries. But in India, for example, the no procedure is suspended. There are emergency provisions within the constitution and within the legal framework that gets activated, and then you know they work within those procedures. So every country has unique uh, uh, so uh, legal framework. I think you should adhere to the uh, uh, legal framework. the second part is to uh, do a rapid assessment as i mentioned earlier most of the countries were not prepared and there was no business continuity plan but uh, i think uh, we are in this phase in which already various treasuries in the countries they have done that actually they have done a rapid business process assessment review and then uh, identified what are the payments that need to be accelerated and what are the payments that can be slowed down or even suspended so on the cash management and fund flow i would come to my second point so every country as abn also mentioned is facing cash crunch economies are rattled one after another another so treasury is responsible for managing cash so the efficiency of cash management is was important even before but now it is extremely critical so as we have seen in many countries there is a lot of idle cash lying in various bank accounts in one country that i have worked with there are 34000 bank accounts which are not connected to the treasury single account so 
I think one of the important things that Treasury need to consider is to how to sweep all the government funds into the Treasury single account. I know it has its nuances and it has uh, difficulties. For example, uh, SOEs, they might have their separate uh, cash. So they may be, you get into a difficult area, but at least the core government's bank accounts, that cash you can bring in easily within the existing rules of the game. So I think that is important from a cash management perspective. Similarly, donors. Now there are a lot of donors who are interested to support the client countries but then they have reservations about how to protect their money. So I think uh, their res reservations are leg legitimate. And in order to assuage their fears, I think the ring fencing the donor funds account into a separate bank account makes a sense. Uh, I have, and then some countries are raising, some countries are raising cash actually, for example, Hungary, in the first week of April, they issued special bonds and they were able to raise 2 billion euros those bonds from the market. Uh, similarly, on the cash limit, when you are spending, you typically in many countries there are cash limits uh, under which the ministries are allowed to spend. I think those cash limits now need to be revised so that ministries, especially the health ministry, has more flexibility. They don't need to come to the Ministry of Finance for every approval. Uh, and for uh, and a lot of uh, COVID response is happening at the sub-regional level, sub-national level. So the uh, um, uh, provincial governments or state governments or maybe the district governments, they are also heavily involved. And then most of these, they depend on from the central uh, ministry for the fund transfer. And in many countries, there are several uh, procedural hurdles, you know, there are several approval steps, I think those approval steps could be reviewed and uh, every effort should be made to do the direct transfers from the trade single account to the service delivery units. I have seen this happening in Africa and some other countries where tools, for example, tools used to get fund from province and then from the district education officer and from the district education officer to the headmaster, three or four loops. And they just said that we are not sending money to these districts and provincial. We are sending that money directly to the schools. So same can be applied to the health clinics and hospitals. So I think this is something that uh, you need to see within the, your own context. Uh, similarly, I have seen in Hungary, for example, on cash management, they used to have uh, uh, weekly cash forecasting reports. But now, as part of the COVID response, they are doing daily cash forecasting, which is really great because daily cash forecasting is difficult in many countries. After decades, they have not been able to do that. But in Hungary, they just in order to manage cash more efficiently, they were able to produce daily cash forecasting report in Hungary. On payment processing, now most of the treasuries have learned their lessons. They are already doing that, right? So for example, some of the payments that you need to fast track, you need to identify some other pay payments that can be fast tracked, some other payments that can be suspended, so some other payments that can be slowed down. For example, salary. The salary need to be paid, but uh, transfers, posting, retroactive uh, salary payments, you know, these are the things that you can slow down because nothing is happening on the ground. So you just keep, do the regular salary payroll without doing a lot of changes. Uh, so this is something that can minimize the burden on the treasuries. Similarly, capital, uh, capital payments. Because of the social distance, the capital projects are in most countries, there's no activity happening. So maybe if there are certain pipeline payments that you need to process, process those payments. But uh, I think the capital payments should not come in the first place and even if they are coming there is i mean you can prioritize health related activities more than the regular construction of roads and whatever capital funds so the prioritization should happen again according to the contracts uh, context but i think it is extremely important to prioritize your payments and uh, one of the important thing is the digital payments so the countries which had if miss and IFMIS was connected to the central bank, they were able to manage and cope with COVID response much better. For example, Kosovo and many other countries that I know, uh, they provided online access to IFMIS uh, to the staff who are working from home. 
and they were approving the payments. The workflow was happening. People were following the workflow while sitting there in their homes. And once the payment was approved electronically, the payment was sent from the IFNI to the central bank. So I think the digital digitalization is very, very important. This is the lesson that we have. We knew already, but uh, countries were reluctant to follow that path or slow. I think we need to accelerate that going forward. And uh, in some countries, I think, for example, small payments can be done through digital, like mobile payments, because uh, handling cash is uh, risky these days. If, for example, for remote employees who are at the border or who are uh, who don't have the bank account, for example, so typically in many countries there is a practice that the controlling officer at that unit, you know, takes cash and delivers the cash to the small employees. So I think for those employees, the option of uh, mobile payments or digital payments should be explored because it is risky to handle cash. Uh, from a health perspective, from control perspective as well as from health perspective. Uh, similarly, on the so my, my last point is about fiduciary oversight and reporting. So uh, I think the many countries are publishing quarterly budget execution reports. Some of the countries are now uh, actually now these budget execution reports more than ever they need to be fast tracked. So as uh, we had a conference with uh, some countries in Europe and uh, Kosovo. Uh, shared that they are doing, doing doing a daily budget execution report. So this is just fantastic. So I will urge urge the countries, member countries of SEMNA, that if they cannot do a daily budget execution report, at least they should do a weekly budget execution report and publish it online to engender the trust of the people that uh, the money is being spent on the right at the right purpose and it is being. Uh, it is going to the health sector appropriately and it's being spent, so there should be some transparency. Uh, order trail of all the transactions, this is extremely important. When we are pushing for accelerated payments, the risk is high. So you are losing the control, but you are enhancing the risk profile. So I think it is extremely important that if you have some IT system like IFMIS, the order trail should be uh, uh, activated if it is not activated already. And uh, uh, so that is one thing. And the, one important thing is uh, uh, to track the COVID-related uh, funding. You see, in most of the countries, the budget has been restructured. So the most, the money for all the ministries are now suspended and it is now rooted to the, uh, to the health sector. So it is extremely important to track COVID-related payments. And some countries have uh, created special codes in the chart of account, for example, a project code or a uh, program code uh, to track COVID-related uh, uh, transfers and funding and budgeting and execution, because that's where uh, people are interested. So I think even in your budget execution report, typically, which is a very high level report, giving the budget execution ministry by ministry or function by function. But since now most of the budget is moving to the COVID related or health expenditures. So that specific report on budget execution report for health or COVID to be much more detailed and granular because most of the money is moving into that one kind of program. So that is important. Uh, Similarly, uh, so the uh, one of the risks that I have seen is the risk of uh, because we are losing control, then there are this possibility of fraud. So I think uh, there are a lot of uh, possibilities of fraud, but I will just highlight a few points that uh, perhaps uh, in my experience, uh, whenever fraud happens, suddenly there is a vendor bank account, which was dormant for several years or several months, suddenly it becomes active. So you should have red alerts in your system. Whenever a dormant account is activated with large payments, so it should be a red flag and it should alert somebody that look into this, what is happening. Or uh, there is a bank account or a vendor with very low activity over the years, he is supplying you small supplies here and there, and suddenly you see surge in payments. So that again should cause should cause a red alert. That I think you should set it up in the system that sudden surge in uh, a payment pattern should give you an alert. 
Uh, similarly, salary frauds are very common. You create a new employee and then you just create, you know, start funding the salary into that. I think the change in the employee bank accounts or creation of new employees should have some additional controls in order to avoid those frauds. So I will not go into the too, too much details, but these are the, just the big, uh, the, the, the lessons that we have learned from around the world in fraud cases that I, you can, I think you can uh, think through these lessons and apply uh, in times of lesser controls to strengthen your fiduciary oversight. Uh, one of the questions that most of the traders are asking is the digital legal status of the digital documents, scanned documents. For example, if you have uh, enabled home-based work, so people might send you scanned invoices. So in some countries, there are some procedures to accept the digital documents, but in some countries, it's not very clear. I mean, that the law does not stop you, but then there's lack of clarity. So I think you should devise some procedures to accept the digital documents. One of the options that some countries have uh, adopted is to accept these documents as provisional documents. So you accept them as provisional documents, but then ask them if you don't have the legal procedure to submit the physical documents when they can come, but at least you don't hold their payments. So you can accept them as provisional documents. So since I'm running slightly on time, so I will be quick now. This is my perhaps last slide, and I will have one summary slide. So what happens next? You're already in the middle of pandemic. Perhaps some countries like Vietnam, they are over the hill. They have already, I think, come to, very fortunately, they are come to a stability mode. But now we should think about recovery. One of the important lessons that we have learned is that most of the treasuries are not ready. They did not have any business continuity plan. Now is the time in the recovery phase that we prepare business continuity plan that these and pandemic can come. And there is a strong possibility. Scientists are telling us that there might be a second wave. So I think preparing a business continuity plan would be important. And uh, important thing is that many treasuries are, have already uh, have some kind of business continuity plan for uh, incorporating the lessons you learn from your response in the proper business continuity plan is important. The second piece is the IT system and drug tech. I think you should strengthen uh, your IT system and the security and infrastructure. Many countries had it missed, but they have no mechanism to enable remote access to it missed. If that is the case, similarly, countries didn't have even email, uh, uh, the formal official email to communicate. Similarly, the document management system and scanners and other digital technologies, which are essentially very, very important. I think in the post-COVID phase, this is the time that we should uh, strengthen our IT systems for remote access and home-based. Uh, work and if there is no IT system to accelerate reform that we have been advocating and strengthening over the last many decades, I think it's more than ever necessary to accelerate the digitalization in every respect, especially with treasuries. And then you need to measure progress on recovery. This is again very important how the budget situation is, how the industry spending patterns are, how the, budget, you know, how the reports are happening. So this is important from a business continuity planning perspective. The second piece is a disaster risk financing mechanism. Uh, many countries, they, they didn't have any disaster risk financing mechanism. Some countries which were used to uh, having uh, disasters, like Caribbean countries, they have tornadoes and you know, star, uh, uh, floods. Uh, they had some kind of a contingency funds which they can pull, but most of the countries have no contingency fund, I think. So I think there is a need to, to think through some kind of a disaster risk financing mechanism. Uh, some countries have uh, opened uh, special purpose bank accounts because right now there's a lot of surge in charity and uh, NGOs and other donors and even citizens wanting to uh, contribute to the national cause. For that money to flow into the system, some countries have opened special purpose 
trust fund accounts. So I think this is important that you open the special purpose trust fund accounts. And uh, then you need to be very transparent about this because transparency of these trust fund accounts is again a question mark. Uh, and people lose trust if there is no transparency of the use of these trust fund accounts. Uh, the last point is the system readiness. Uh, the, again, some of the important reforms that we have been trying to promote in the, most of the client countries, there's a need more than ever that they should be accelerated. So the treasury signal account and the use of fitness and technology and GovTech uh, will be extremely important. And uh, post audit, uh, yeah, post audit again, since right now, audit is held up in most other countries. There is no audit happening because tradies are in a, in a very emergency situation. But I think in the post uh, COVID uh, phase, uh, treasuries should think uh, through and support the audit, post audit, both internal audit as well as external audit to see, you know, to see the controls and what other control weaknesses are happening during the audit. And coordination with the Supreme Audit Institution will be very important. So in summary, uh, I think uh, the business continuity plan through some kind of um, crisis management committee and communication and uh, operationalization of home-based work is important. Uh, of the emergency arrangements, then again, uh, follow the legal framework but then assess which business functions are important, which payments can be accelerated, which can be slowed, which can be suspended, and move towards digital documents and digital payments, strengthen your uh, fiduciary and oversight. And in the post-COVID, uh, my key message is to prepare the business continuity plan, prepare special audit for COVID-19 uh, related expenditures, and increase and accelerate the use of technology. I'll stop at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Karam, for this uh, very rich presentation, um, which really very systematically looks at uh, the core functions of treasuries and how they have been impacted uh, globally and how treasuries responded. I think many of them are very relevant uh, for the treasury uh, of our community. It's, uh, so we now have uh, half an hour for Q&A. So let, let me see from the different uh, CCOP members if there are any specific questions on, on the core points and core functions that, that you mentioned. If not, I have a few myself. But uh, let's, let's first see from the, the colleagues. You can also use the chat function to send in your questions or raise your hand. So maybe in, in the meantime, um, uh, I think what, what, what you said also resonates with the survey the PEMNA Secretariat did uh, in May uh, leading to the BCOP, uh, which also looked at the fiscal responses. And I think in, indeed many of these fiscal responses were implemented by a treasury. Uh, and so it, it's a, a major aspect that came out of it was really reallocation. And therefore, I very much appreciate your, your title of agile. It's really about agility, proactivity. Now, how can we reallocate resources quickly where it's needed first to the health center, the front line, uh, but then also quickly to relieve expenditures uh, to people, to companies, uh, and I think this, these relocations uh, really require a very close collaboration between the budget uh, as well as uh, treasury, right? Because uh, you need to know what, what resources you have and where you can take the money from, you know? And that's uh, very good to hear that uh, some countries uh, speed up the budget execution uh, monitoring to, be, to make sure that... Uh, we don't cut contracts which are ongoing, we don't create areas, we don't actually have negative impacts through our relocation. So I think that's really something which would be very useful to hear from the PEMNA members 
how they went about these reallocations, because this was really the first line of uh, government responses to the COVID crisis. And it, it did include quite a few aspects which you mentioned, uh, requiring sometimes more flexible rules, uh, proactive cash management, proactive procurement. Many of our treasuries also have the procurement function. Um, and then really uh, the, the effective payment. Um, so that, so that, that, that would be one, one, one question. Um, I see that uh, Suhas also has a question. So please come in, Suhas. Yeah, thanks, Koram. Very nice presentation. I just wanted to mention that given the crisis, given the extent of the crisis, and given the extent of development in some of the countries, uh, it's good to have IT-based uh, solutions. Some of them are to be done very quickly, but we need to move on two parallel tracks. One is what can we do in the immediate future, next three, four, five months, uh, using the existing systems to make things improve things, and sim simultaneously move on a parallel track to improve the IT um, IT solutions that may provide a more a finer and long-term solution. Uh, the second issue was be, would also always be to have a very good eye on the revenue inflows or lack of revenue inflows that will occur in the near future. Thanks. John, great point. I think uh, the, always the discussion with the service delivery ministry has been even before pandemic is a balance between flexibility and control. While the health ministry, the ministry uh, has always complained that we don't have the flexibility, but the Ministry of Finance always has emphasized control. So what is the right balance? I think uh, uh, this is a very serious debate and uh, we should move out of the control's mind and uh, into the results-oriented uh, monitoring framework rather than controlling each and every transaction. So give the budget, give the money to the ministry, and ask them about the results rather than controlling their each and every small payment. So I think in this regard, there are several uh, discussions that are already happening. One of the discussion is to give some kind of uh, like a uh, plastic card to the spending units and raise the limit of the interest that they can spend. So this gives them more flexibility. And then, uh, and then obviously, uh, result-based monitoring rather than ex and uh, payment control at a very small level. Just monitor big, big payments. You don't need to monitor every small payment. So there are several uh, PFM tools and te techniques uh, program budgeting is one, for example, and similarly, the interest account, advance payments to the service delivery units, uh, and then the level of the, the allocation authority. In India, for example, the Ministry of Finance gave a blanket uh, spending authority to the Ministry of Health. Usually, typically, they issue, for example, monthly or maybe quarterly uh, allocation of authority, spending authority, release. But during the COVID, they just gave the blanket authority. They said, whatever budget you have, you can spend it. So this is uh, how various countries have adopted the response to their situations. Uh, I think on Suha's point, uh, fantastic point. Uh, I cannot overemphasize this point uh, that we need to uh, do the parallel track. So whatever existing systems you have, for example, if you have IFMIS, many countries have IFMIS, right? So it takes very little to, uh, to enable a remote access. Just giving you one example. The infrastructure is already there. You have servers, you have server rooms, if miss, whatever network. You just give them remote access. Similarly, uh, in Myanmar, we are, I think Madam is here, we are working with Myanmar authorities that a lot of staff are using their personal mobile phone to do the coordination. So you support them with the data plan, right? So why should they pay for the data they are using for the official function? So I think this coming back to the Suha's point, there are some quick fixes that we can do immediately in the next three to four months, actually. 
So which we are doing in Myanmar, we are doing, KPN is leading the charge and we are supporting the government uh, to get assess their requirement, immediate requirement. For example, video conferencing or email, official email. Many countries don't have official email in the treasury, right? So these quick fixes can be done. But of course, uh, I think the real thing is uh, the long-term reforms around the coverage of ISMIS. Most countries have ISMIS, but the coverage is 30%, 60%, 70%. So a lot of manual processes. So we need to digitalize. We need to automate the processes. And I think the one of the important area of reform is the digital payments. Uh, Fabian and I have been discussing uh, in Myanmar's context and in some other context also, I think we should promote that. This is high time that we should start. Start thinking. And with uh, Suhas, we have been discussing that offline. So this is something I think that we should promote. I think I think uh, I think Khoram, the the point you're making is also very important. That just because there is a crisis, the long-term perspective of how things should improve, how systems should improve, should not take a backseat. They should continue at the same time. While meeting the crisis, we should not forget that there has to be a long-term plan to improve systems and procedures. No, thank you, Suhas, and that's an excellent point. Maybe I want, would like to build on that. Indeed, uh, some of the agile practices we had to implement uh, during this crisis, maybe we want to keep them uh, and then try the, and find them in our legislation. You know? um, now, they are, whether it's home-based work or more, at least more connectivity and more flexibility, uh, now there are companies like Twitter which will make that a rule. But also more budget flexibility, and uh, Karam mentioned indeed having a, swift, uh, a strong mechanism in place for disaster risk financing. So many countries have developed that for the type of natural disasters, which has really a physical impact. Uh, but these systems were stretched now by this, this type of health disaster, which was really foreseen. And so that would be interesting to see and hear also from, from different colleagues from the community, uh, what, of, what are the lessons learned from this crisis? Let's no crisis go to waste. So what are the good practices, the agile practices, which we should keep going forward? And how can we build that in the reforms uh, and support? Dear members, please come forward. Uh, I know you have been very busy these last three months uh, uh, fighting uh, COVID fires, but uh, really want to have a, an, an active discussion and everyone uh, participate. So, an appeal to yeah. all the permanent members connected. Yeah, I mean, it, it should not necessarily be a question. You can share your perspective, your views. It's okay. Just it's a, just a discussion forum. We are sharing. Of course, questions are also welcome. And you can share them in writing also if you want through the chat uh, group. That's the benefit of what I um, Just while, while, while colleagues uh, come up with their comments and, and questions, maybe uh, one last from my side uh, on this topic. I saw that some countries like Korea, for instance, did pre-financing. And I guess that's sometimes a bit difficult in current rules right? where, you, where you, don't, you haven't received the service yet. And it's not for a works contract where it's really enshrined in the contract and there's no guarantee that secures that. So, Akram, if you can maybe share uh, some experiences on, on pre-financing, and that would be useful. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on uh, pre-financing? Yes, so, uh, so in order to inject cash in the economy, the government actually finances goods and services which have not yet been received. <clears throat> so, uh, for instance, through coupons or through, uh, through different, uh, uh, dif different uh, purchases, uh, notably in the service sector, you know, since um, uh, restaurants and hotels uh, were very affected by the, by the uh, public health measures. Uh, so the, the government and Ministry of Finance stepped in to pre-finance uh, some future nights, um, uh, future services, which have not yet been rendered. 
Yeah. Or sometimes advance, think, uh, increase, yeah. or sometimes increase advances on existing contracts, which just inject cash and support companies. Yeah, yeah. I think this is something that is uh, very contextual. In those countries where you have very uh, robust controls and overall environment of controls is uh, stable, uh, we can do that. But in many countries that I have worked, uh, this has been massively abused. Uh, so, in Malawi or some of the other African countries, there, was, there has been a practice of free funding without the goods and services being delivered. Uh, the invoices are received and paid. Uh, so, what they do is to put the money in a separate bank account, which is a private bank account of the controlling officer after the, pro uh, the, the, the payment is taken out of the treasury single account. Uh, so in the books, everything is delivered, everything is, uh, uh, they call it pro forma invoices, but then uh, there is an informal arrangement uh, to deliver the goods and services. So that's a very gray area. So I think uh, every country has to assess its own control environment and uh, the risk of abuse should also be kept in mind. Korea, the control environment in Korea is very different. Uh, robust, it's, everything is digital and they have come a long way actually. Uh, so it, it will vary from country to country. Thank, thank you, Karam. Uh, so who, who wants to come in from uh, the PEMNA countries? Um, I know there will be a presentation from Vietnam, but uh, I think Vietnam was really one of the countries that uh, managed to tackle this COVID crisis uh, most effectively and fastest. Uh, zero dead and uh, kids back to school now. So it would be interesting to hear a bit from you. Um, we also see that okay. Indonesia is connected and also had yeah. very... Uh, uh, very uh, proactive responses. Uh, it would be great to also hear from you. Fabian and colleagues, if there are no questions or comments, um, I will leave because it's uh, quite late here. Is it okay? A absolutely. Let's let's uh, give my give last chance. Colleagues, anyone wants to come in on, on this uh, Agile Treasury presentation or should we move to the next uh, session? I think it only remains to thank Koram. Absolutely. So then, and anyway, if there, if there are further questions later on, you know, we remain available. I'm available. Yeah, exactly. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll yeah. send them over to Koram you can think yeah. uh, think of them after a good night of sleep so thank you Excellent. very much Karam, for for your active participation uh, joining so late and sharing uh, your thinking on agile treasuries uh, thank you very much good, Fabian good night, and Pema, secretariat thank you good good morning and good night bye okay Okay, so we, we let us then move to the next session, which is a deep dive on country experiences. And uh, thank you very much for Myanmar to volunteer a presentation. Um, and uh, Myanmar has had a, a very strong response to the COVID uh, outbreak. The government adopted the COVID uh, can make relief uh, plan. And again, many of these roads lead back to Treasury, which has to help implement them, help find the cash to implement them. It's a combination of different relief efforts. Uh, I don't want to uh, steal the presentation, so without further ado, let me hand over then to Myanmar. Uh, and hopefully there will be uh, lots of discussions. It would be also good to reflect uh, on what we heard today uh, on Agile Treasuries globally and what it means for Myanmar. Uh, so 
please, uh, Dawkins, so the floor is yours. Um, thank you for your presentation. Yeah, Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Kim So, uh, Deputy Director General of the Treasury Department, and I'm I'm going to share what we are facing the COVID-19 and how to respond our people uh, in Myanmar. So this my topic is the import, impact of the COVID-19 in Myanmar. This is the contents of our presentation. Um, uh, Myanmar, <coughs> Myanmar was when the first confirmed case was found in uh, on 20, uh, 23rd March 2020. It was the imported case for Myanmar. As of the uh, 27 May 2020, the total confirmed case is 203. Uh, a being treated kit is 74. Uh, two, uh, one, 123 patients are recovering from the disease. We have a uh, six death dis disease. Uh, Myanmar government have uh, uh, began the preparation for the possible outbreak of the COVID-19 on January 2020. The government is taking several precautionary measures. Uh, one of them is a public hand washing campaign on um, 18, uh, 21st March 2020. In order to reduce of the risk of spreading the COVID-19, to encourage people to stay home and to wear the to practice the social distancing and to stay uh, to wear the mask when they go out. And the government also imposed a night curfew across the country. And the Ministry of Health uh, introduced the uh, COVID, uh, National Call Center for COVID-19 on 8 April 2020. The government began community-based facility quarantine on 22nd March 2020 to enforce health quarantine declaration, isolation uh, in con concentration for high school person. And on first, uh, first uh, from the 1st April 2020, our state councillor, Dr. Aung San Suu Kyi, speak via Zoom with the people helping in fight against COVID-19 pandemic. We also, uh, amid the outbreak of the COVID-19, the government is taking several precautionary measures and simultaneously trying to stabilize its eco our economy, like other countries. So the government introduced a certain relief measure for the business that is a, um, that, that business are affected significantly by the COVID-19. And the government established the COVID-19 fund on March 18, 2020. Um, the, the, fund, the capital of the fund is the 100 billion Myanmar jets. It is equivalent yearly uh, US dollar, uh, 17 million US dollar. Um, 50 million is from the government uh, budget, the volume fund. Another 50, million, uh, 50 billion is a uh, uh, social, social security fund. And it is for the relief measure for the CMB business, hotel, tourism business, and SME business. So they uh, to offer the law uh, to, um, to reduce their uh, burden. Uh, uh, the interest rate is 1%, and majority is at one year. And also, the government also is the deadline for the tax payments and introduce the tax exemption for Myanmar owned business. Myanmar owned business. The extension of deadline for the advanced uh, corporate income tax and commercial tax payment for the fis uh, fiscal year 2020 
and also the business uh, for the business uh, they will also have a, a exempted from the paying the two percent advance income tax on export until the end of the current fiscal year end of march uh, end of september end of september 2020 for the worker, uh, the, uh, the governor also um, um, to ease the deadline for the contribution payment. They extend their they they, they extend their deadline for the payment from the 15 day to um, three months. We also have a fiscal measure in response and in Myanmar. So to mitigate the economic impact of the global pandemic by the implementing the new measures and response plan ranging from the monetary reforms and increase government spending to step to strengthen the country health care system. The government issued the COVID-19 economic relief plan CRB on 27 April 2020. And this includes seven goals. 10 strategies, 36 action plans, and 76 plans. The, that cover a broad range of extraordinary fiscal measure and human focused uh, policy response. Uh, this is the, um, our government uh, taking the uh, financial measures for the COVID 19. Uh, at the, uh, uh, the government total spending for COVID 19. And COVID-19 treatment and prevention is the 19.46 billion Myanmar jets and the 22nd May 2020. It is equi nearly equivalent is a 13.8 million US dollar. And our government also prepared to stimulate spending of spending up to 5% of their GDP to ease the impact of COVID-19. And government increased the budget of procurement supplies supplementary for entitlement of the, those participating in the appendix provisions and control. And also to increase the stimulus spending to re provide, revive the economy as well as the spending to the average health sector and provide cash and food for the low income, uh, low income household by the uh, cover, uh, GI general fund reserve, and which, uh, which, uh, which return from the 10% of the uh, budget allocation of the government entity. Uh, during the, in April, uh, during the stay, home, stay at home period, uh, we support the essential food for, uh, essential food supply to the most vulnerable workers and low income people. Government also have planned to uh, provide the cash assistance, uh, plan to cash assistance for those uh, struggling across the country. They are uh, facing with their, uh, they, they, are, they are suffering the impact of the COVID-19. We all, the government also exempt, exempted, uh, exempted the household electricity bill to 150 unit for the two months. And, and then we also have a reserve fund for basic food staff. It is uh, in the fund is the 38 billion uh, for the possible emergency condition at the COVID threat. For the finance uh, development assistance to re uh, response, we also have a financial assistance from the Mardi, uh, World Bank and IMF. So we have a, on 22nd May 2020, um, we have a approved from the parliament to take the 50 million US dollar emergency loan from the World Bank to improve uh, hospital system, especially for the uh, ICU facility and capacity of health workers to battle uh, COVID-19 across the across the country. We expect the budget deficit widen and this this fiscal year and next due to the extra spending to mitigate the impact of COVID on the economy. So we have a IMF. We we also have a we take that. 70, 700 million US dollar from the IMF 
to block the budget deficit, resulting from the increased spending on the economic recovery, social security, and health sector improvement due to the COVID pandemic. <clears throat> due to the COVID pandemic. Uh, the other measure in, in Myanmar is uh, we, uh, we reduce the, uh, for the mon monetary reform, the central bank uh, reduced the interest rate. So now interest rate is a central bank, is, rate is a 7%, minimum bank deposit rate is a 5%, maximum bank lending rate is 10%. For the education sector, the government reopened the school in July. This is a, a target for the uh, education sector. That is our um, what we are facing 19 in COVID-19 and respond for um, our people. Thank you so much. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much for this. Uh, Presentation. Indeed, I think Myanmar had, had a very uh, large response and multifaceted response to COVID. Uh, we try to provide relief to people, um, to companies, uh, as well as uh, obviously supporting uh, very urgent emergency health expenditures uh, and relocations. Uh, therefore, I think it was what was also interesting in the case of Myanmar. It's really a whole of government effort which mobilizes local governments, central government, Ministry of Finance, uh, different uh, ministries, but also state-owned enterprises. Uh, and particularly state-owned banks, right, which are really the main instrument for providing uh, credit uh, and loan facilities at very low interest rates uh, to, to enable uh, companies and, uh, to overcome the cash crunch. I think mean, that's, that's a, it's a great presentation. It would be interesting also to hear then later during the Q&A uh, how, how other government institutions responded uh, to that and more specifically the central bank. So what measures the central bank took and how, that, uh, how this partnership between Treasury and the central bank worked. But uh, before that, uh, before the discussion, let me hand over to the Philippines uh, for the presentation. So, Ms. Amodas, uh, the floor is yours. If you can please uh, show us your presentation and run us uh, through your experience uh, of sweating through the COVID crisis and uh, trying to reassure financial markets and ensure uh, the unprecedented financing needs uh, that uh, arose in the Philippines. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fabian. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me clearly. Hello. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I, I'll be sharing my presentation, but while I'm sharing my presentation, I'll just give a, a short background of what happened in the Philippines. So, um, the last two weeks of March mark uh, the biggest challenge and was very chaotic uh, for the Philippines. Um, many of these challenges uh, resulted to now what we call the new normal. So uh, on the Friday, on the 13th of Friday, or Friday the 13th of March, uh, President Duterte announced that the Philippines or uh, the entire Luzon, including Metro Manila, will be placed under the enhanced community quarantine or lockdown, effective March 16. That's a Monday. So uh, during the weekend, uh, many of the Filipinos or uh, citizens living in Metro Manila wanted to move out of uh, the metropolis and some uh, rushed to buy food and supplies. But for the Treasury, um, the, the Treasury immediately organized a, uh, a Viber group uh, of which uh, the members comprise of the management officers or the MANCOM. So all of the communications, uh, questions, instructions were directed through the Viber group or the Mancom Viber group. So on the, uh, what are the challenges that was uh, encountered by the Treasury? Um, for one, we have the, we call it physical distancing protocol. So um, not all employees were allowed to report for work on Monday, on the 16th of uh, March, um, because 
some of our employees are, 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 are either 60 years old or above. Some are, have uh, immunocompromised uh, uh, um, situations. And uh, there were no uh, transportation. So what the Treasury did is they identified the skeletal force or the skeleton workforce that would be reporting uh, for duty. This only uh, comprised of essential functions of the Treasury, uh, basically working around payment, cash management, um, uh, auction operations, and other that, uh, that may be necessary for the Treasury to survive the, the lockdown. So um, since there were fewer uh, Treasury employees reporting for work, some of those who are not reporting had to resort to work from home arrangements. And uh, we had to use all our shuttle services or our transportation services to shuttle uh, employees to and from the office. So we had a route plan where we got all the addresses of our employees. So uh, the shuttle would uh, ferry them to the office. Um, and then there was also the difficulty of uh, coordinating with private and public sector. However, we, we used uh, all media platform. We, we used the internet, we used the web. Um, the Treasury has a, uh, an, a, a Facebook page where we, uh, we uh, try to cover live any auctions. And then um, the Treasury, all Treasury, Bureau of the Treasury employees have their official email. So all Treasury operations uh, memos are sent by our records uh, group and disseminated to all employees through the, their uh, official emails. Um, we also made use of uh, various uh, web platforms like the Zoom, the uh, Webex for meetings and other uh, webinars that the Treasury had to uh, conduct. And uh, some, uh, again, uh, what we did was a rotational uh, shifting arrangement. So uh, there, there's just a limited number of personnel that has to report for work. So in the, in the normal, in the previous normal situation, the work schedule of the treasury is usually from Mondays to Fridays. But because of the shifting and the rotation, we have uh, work from Mondays to Saturdays. And employees who are not working during the day are encouraged to work from home so that the treasury operations will still continue. Um, no, due to the lockdown, a lot of people, well, people were not allowed to go outside of their houses. And so, um, Offices, shops, malls, and other non-essential stores were closed. There were very minimal economic activity because people uh, only bought essential supplies like food and medicine, and they were holding on to the cash that they have because uh, they were free for, to go out. Um, also, the Bureau of the uh, the Bureau of Internal Revenue um, through the DOF suspended or deferred the payment of uh, internal revenue taxes. Because, well, people didn't, ha didn't want to go out. So they suspended the payment. Uh, loan payments were also suspended. Utilities payment were also uh, initially deferred or suspended. So there were really no cash running around the market or running around the, the commerce. So um, also, uh, it should be noted that in 2020, uh, March 2020, President Duterte immediately signed what we call as the Bayanihan to Heal as One Act. So it's, it is a law where all of the operations or all of the possible um, instructions, um, activities of the government is anchored. It's basically an emergency response uh, act where national government agencies and local government agencies, as well as private and uh, the, the, the citizens are encouraged to anchor all their activities in. So one of the activities here is the provision of emergency facilities 
So we had to, the national government had to build uh, COVID isolation facilities. And then uh, we had to procure um, medical supplies, uh, PPEs, and other COVID-related uh, supplies. So there was a large disbursement that, that the government needs to fund because we needed uh, emergency, uh, because this is connected to the emergency response of the government. And also there were higher borrowing costs because uh, the, the financial market the situation was, was very vulnerable. It was very chaotic. And um, there were fear that the, the government does not have any money to fund uh, the survival of the country. So uh, there was some cash squeeze and there were, we had to tighten our belt, uh, so, so to say. So again, um, as I've said in the previous slide, the market was volatile uh, due to the liquidity issues. Uh, people were just withdrawing their cash because they needed it to buy for their essentials and they were holding on to their cash. There were no collections in, uh, for loan payments. Um, treasury bills and bond auction trades were, were high and there was immense uncertainty. So what the Treasury did, uh, it, it should be said is that uh, for the disbursement, we have a decentralized system. Um, again, I, uh, Farouk said that, you know, we should go into monitoring. So rather than control, uh, here we see that, that the disbursement system in the Philippines is decentralized because we have the local government code that we cannot control the funds that is given to the local government. So what the Treasury only control is the timing or discretion of when the subsidies for the local government or the internal revenue allotment to the local government and subsidies to the state owned is to be paid. So once the subsidies is uh, directed to the local government and they receive it, they have the discretion or autonomy as to what project, as to what COVID-related project they would uh, put it on. Uh, same as with the subsidies of the state-owned enterprises, they have this uh, autonomy because it is included in one of the provisions of the um, uh, law that uh, created this state-owned enterprises. So again, uh, being anchored to the Bayanihan Act, uh, national government agencies ha had the responsibility to prioritize programs that are necessary for emergency responses. So we had to limit all transactions and revolve all transactions to what we call as survival activities for the meantime because we needed to survive and because nobody was prepared for what uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, would, uh, for, would, would be affecting us. Um, agencies' uh, requirements were determined on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, for our 2021 budget, um, well, for the Treasury, there are already um, meetings as to um, identify only essential activities. So non-essential activities that can be delayed, we, are, we will be delaying it, but for just the Treasury or other agencies, government agencies to survive, uh, we will be choosing the prioritizing activities for that. Um, uh, funds and subsidies were also transferred by a uh, bank transfers or check uh, because the due to the COVID-19 and previous to the COVID-19, the government has been uh, espousing the idea of a cashless transaction because, um, well, more so now that we have COVID-19, it's really very risky to use cash payments. Uh, you, I mean, the cash itself because it transfers from person to person. Now, to, to generate cash, um, we requested uh, the support of our state-owned enterprises. Uh, again, uh, they already know what to do because we have the Bayanihan Act. So they are encouraged to provide support to the national government. So um, we were able to get uh, more than $2 billion U.S. dollars. Uh, as dividends and financial support from the state state owned enterprises who are earning uh, some of the dividends were um, provided to the national government in advance 
And then we have the repo agreement with the central bank, which uh, yielded uh, around 6 billion US dollars. We also were able to sweep uh, some accounts outside of the treasury single account or the TSA. So this comprised of some of the funds that uh, were in, in dormant accounts, while others were borrowed by the national government. And then uh, we have this um, fundraising activities, which is a regular activity of the, the treasury. Uh, we do it every year. Uh, it's not really COVID related, but somehow we got some fundings from um, uh, the Euro Global Bands and the Regional Treasury Bands. We do this because, you know, we have several, we experienced several disasters. So we needed to uh, have activities to fund whatever uh, calamities we have uh, or requirements that we have if we have a typhoon or a uh, an earthquake. So we, we're used to having disasters that we have this uh, regular fundraising, but now we we have this extra fund to use for COVID. So uh, on stabilizing the financial markets, um, it, it, we, uh, we all know that during the lockdown, there were no payments to banks, there were no activities. Uh, payments to of credit cards were also suspended. So we had to infuse uh, liquidity, especially to government financial institutions uh, to prevent possible bank runs. So uh, we, we put in place some term deposits uh, with government banks and then we bought or we made an outright purchase of the GFI holdings of government bonds so that the money would just circle around the government. And then uh, we, we also rejected uh, excessively high interest rates because we have uh, we have the mechanism to identify uh, what is the benchmark rate so if if the rates are too high we reject it to send signal to the market that uh, although the government is uh, cash uh, we have limitations in the cash we can still find ways uh, to source the fund so you don't have to charge us with higher interest rates and also, it sends a good signal to the market that uh, we have other ways. So you don't, you have to uh, level the interest rates. And then we also asked the central bank to increase the scale of its government bond buying programs in the secondary market. This would help um, banking, the banking institutions, uh, commercial banks and private banks, to have uh, a sort of liquidity infusion and again prevent them from having bank runs. Um, so, uh, as a closing remark, um, we, although we learned to take the COVID-19 battle one day at a time, um, we have somehow learned to cope with the financial challenges brought by the COVID-19. So some of the strategies that, or the solutions that we have may not be the perfect solution, but we needed immediate patches patches that needed to be done for the national government to survive. Um, there are no really best practices, but only benchmarks that we can use and improve and try to suit uh, to our circumstances. Uh, uh, we are very appreciative of the opportunity that, that uh, was given to us to share our experience and to also learn from other uh, members of the PEMNA and um, bench, pro most probably benchmark on uh, what they have done. So in, uh, in we, would, we are very, very appreciative. And also as an update, uh, last June 1, we have uh, been moved to a uh, general quarantine. Uh, so from the uh, ECQ, we, we are now on a general community quarantine. So more businesses are open. Uh, slowly, some offices are, are uh, constructions and other offices are also opening. So uh, hopefully, we will try to improve the economic activities in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, for this uh, excellent presentation, really uh, covering a lot of ground uh, in very few slides. Uh, so I think that's really a lot of food for thought also for the discussion afterwards, both in terms of how the personnel of Treasury was affected, and I see you working from home, uh, so am I. And so we're jealous of colleagues which managed to return to the office. And 
I never thought I would actually miss it. Uh, but uh, but also how you how you manage to uh, deal with the cash crunch um, and proactive response, and while doing so, also trying to think of uh, stabilizing the financial markets, right, um, and supporting your state-owned banks. Whereas we've seen in many experiences, uh, treasuries would rely on state-owned banks. Uh, in, in these cash crunch and these hard times, right? So uh, that would be very something that would be interesting to discuss further. So, I'm, so on what partners did you rely and which partners of the broader public sector did you actually have to support uh, through the crisis uh, al along with uh, the public and the companies, right? That, uh, so that's really a, a very interesting point you made. But uh, before, um, so we'll have the discussion afterwards. Uh, so let me maybe uh, hand over to Vietnam for the presentation. So we have two eminent speakers uh, from the Vietnam State Treasury, uh, Mrs. Quyen Wu Tan and Mr. Phuong Huy Thế. So uh, the floor is yours. Um, please share uh, Vietnam's great experience uh, and also from a broader public sector perspective. It would be interesting to hear from you uh, the role of uh, state-owned banks. Um, in the process. Thank you. Vietnam, the, the floor is yours. Great. We do see a good mountain landscape and fresh air. I think there has been some technical issue with from Vietnam. Uh, why don't we first check with the connections that the connection status with the Vietnam first? Can you hear us, Vietnam? Well, so we have a, a business continuity of strain. Apparently, there was a power outage uh, at the World Bank uh, hosting VC for the Vietnam delegation. And so they're trying to recogni uh, reconnect. So let's see if, if, that is, if that proves challenging. Maybe then we can uh, advance a bit uh, the Q&A uh, and then move to Vietnam. So let's give them uh, two more minutes to see if they manage to reconnect. So, So Vietnam, we can Vietnam, hear can you, you now. Me? Excuse me, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes. Yes. So we can start the presentation because uh, I'm trying to uh, to upload the presentation, but I cannot uh, yet. Uh, Rufio, can you can you? Uh, I would like to ask the permanent secretary to uh, show the presentation slides because we, because we cannot. Okay, in that case, we'll try. We'll try from our end. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
because the office is uh, having a blackout, so we are trying to connect from a laptop. Yes, yeah, so we heard. Uh, so let us let us try to put up your slide. Just give us a few more minutes. Okay, can you see the slide yet? <coughs> so far, we only see your uh, just the image of the, your window screen. Okay. Okay, we can start the presentation. À, rất là xin lỗi vì uh, sự cố là phía bên đầu Hà Nội thì chúng ta sẽ không thể nhìn thấy nhau được. Ở yeah, sorry này. that uh, we cannot see each other from Hà Nội. Uh, chắc là lúc nãy thì là uh, tất cả các vị là đã nhìn thấy uh, một đội uh, của uh, VST rất là đông đảo ngồi quanh ghế. But uh, maybe previously you've seen that we have a large team from the VST uh, sitting around the table. Uh, và trong đó thì chúng tôi uh, cũng muốn giới thiệu là có các uh, đại diện lãnh đạo của các đơn vị. Uh, here uh, we would like to uh, you know uh, introduce to you the uh, Directorate members of uh, various uh, functional departments. Uh, trong đó có là cái vụ kiểm soát chi. Uh, we have uh, the Department of Expenditure Controls. Uh, cái cục uh, kế toán nhà nước. Uh, the Department of State Accounting. Uh, cục công nghệ thông tin. Uh, the IT Department. Uh, cục quản lý ngân quỹ. Uh, the Cash Management Department. Uh, thế và bây giờ thì chắc là tôi sẽ phải nhờ ban thư ký. Uh, now I would like uh, the uh, Secretariat to help us, uh, you know, uh, show the slides so that we can uh, start the presentation. The presentation will be delivered by me, Mr. Vian, and Mr. Phương, the director of the IT department. Uh, how to see if you can mute your mic. Thank you. Please. Oh, thank you. Okay. While waiting, I would like to brief you some information relating to the COVID in uh, Vietnam. I find the presentation from the Philippines very interesting because uh, she presented a very uh, good situation of the Philippines. It's the same in Vietnam. Starting from the 21st of January, when we detected the first case of the virus, and then we had some you know uh, visitors from Wuhan to Vietnam immediately the government of Vietnam established uh, mechanisms to control the pandemic uh, on the 30th of January uh, 2020 the government of Vietnam established the steering committee for the pandemic prevention and control at the same time, on the 30th, the Director General of the VST sent a note to all of the Treasury offices. We have 700 Treasury offices in all the districts and uh, provinces with more than 14,000 people. Uh, the idea was first to protect the staff members of the treasuries and then to ensure the continuity of the system. On the 6th of March, after many days of no new infected cases, we have issued some regulations. Uh, by establishing a VST steering committee on the 1st of April 2020, the government you know, uh, practiced social distancing nationwide. Uh, that was introduced by a Prime Minister directive. At the same time, the VST has to adopt social distancing. So we adopted a you know, roster. Uh, 
theo cái chỉ thị của thủ tướng chính phủ ấy, thì kho bạc giống như ngân hàng uh, even uh, in the uh, prime minister phải, uh, uh, we uh, and the banking system the VST and the banking system must continue to Philippines. work so the situation is different to the Philippines Tại vì chúng tôi vẫn phải hoạt động tất cả các uh, nghiệp vụ, tất cả các... Uh, Because we still have to maintain our uh, chỉ có, operations. Chỉ có hạn chế việc đi lại ra ngoài thôi. We just apply social distancing by, you know, uh, encouraging and uh, people to stay at home. Uh, sau uh, 15 ngày mà áp dụng cái cách ly uh, toàn bộ như vậy... Thì, After 15 uh, days of social distancing, 28 cái tỉnh, thành phố, the situation was up thì vẫn tiếp tục uh, phải uh, gọi là cách ly. Social distancing was applied only in 28 provinces and cities. Còn các tỉnh phương còn lại thì là đã được nới lỏng hơn. Uh, the other provinces and cities uh, you know was eased. À, bắt đầu từ ngày 24 tháng 4 uh, from the 24th of April. Cái giai đoạn mới tức là chúng tôi cái việc gọi là transition to a new normal means that we removed social distancing measures. And we uh, moved to a new normal for uh, economic recovery. À, như bà Thủy có nói lúc trước ấy, là uh, đến ngày hôm nay, ngày 13 này, thì ở Việt Nam chỉ có 328 cái trường hợp là có of, bệnh. Uh, July, mm. in Vietnam, we just have a 238 cases of infection. Và từ ngày 16 tháng 4 cho đến hôm nay, tức là đã 48 ngày, thì chúng tôi không có trường hợp nào lây nhiễm ở trong cái cộng đồng. And uh, from the 16th of uh, April, we've got no more new cases of infection within communities. Tổng số 328 cái bệnh nhân COVID thì đã có 298 người là đã được khỏi bệnh, tức là chiếm 91%. So out of 328 infected cases, 298 have recovered, which means that the recovery rate is 91%. Uh, bây giờ tôi sẽ nói thêm một chút nữa về cái uh, những cái hoạt động, những cái giải pháp của kho bạc để mà ứng phó với lại COVID. Now I would like to discuss the measures taken by the VST against uh, the uh, COVID-19. Vừa đảm bảo cái việc là phòng chống dịch. Uh, to uh, combat against the pandemic. Và cũng như là đảm bảo cái hoạt động điều hành của cả hệ thống kho bạc nhà nước. And to maintain the functioning of the whole network of uh, the VST. Như tôi nói lúc trước là kho bạc đã thành lập cái ban chỉ đạo chống dịch ngay tại kho bạc nhà nước ở cơ quan trung ương cũng như kho bạc các tỉnh. As I said from the beginning, the VST established the pandemic steering committee at the central VST and local VST offices. Và chúng tôi đã ra những cái quy định để cho tất cả các kho bạc địa phương là xây dựng những cái phương án, những cái kịch bản để ứng phó trong tất cả các trường hợp là có một công chức hoặc có một người nào đó mà bị bệnh. So we introduced, uh, we required uh, the VST offices to introduce the you know, scenarios uh, of responses uh, in case uh, one staff member got sick or got uh, infected. Uh, so sánh lại với cả cái kinh nghiệm mà của ông uh, tư vấn ông Farok uh, của World Bank vừa nói lúc trước ấy, thì tôi thấy rằng là ở phía Việt Nam kho bạc là đã áp dụng chính phủ Việt Nam nói nói chung và kho bạc Việt Nam nói riêng ấy thì đã áp dụng những cái gọi là phương án khẩn cấp này rất là sớm và có hiệu quả. So um, uh, you know uh, compared with the presentation of Mr. Farok, I think that the government of Vietnam adopted uh, the uh, emergency uh, you know uh, measures very early and very effectively. Uh, với cái, thông qua cái ban chỉ đạo này uh, của trung ương cũng như là tại các địa phương ấy thì chúng tôi đã thường xuyên chỉ đạo quán triệt các cán bộ trong hệ thống là phải thực hiện nghiêm các chỉ đạo các hướng dẫn về phòng chống dịch bệnh. So uh, through the steering committees established at the central VSTs and local offices, we regularly raised awareness among our staff members for strict compliance with the guidelines on our epidemic prevention and control. Uh, cái công tác truyền thông và thông tin là cực kỳ quan trọng bởi vì chúng tôi đã dùng áp dụng tất cả các biện pháp ở trong xã hội thì có những cái uh, truyền thông, uh, những cái TV hoặc là báo chí đã đưa liên tục. Yeah, communication here is extremely important because we apply all means of uh, communications uh, via mass media like TV or newspapers. So we run a constant uh, communication campaigns. Uh, ở trong hệ thống kho bạc thì chúng tôi có sử dụng những cái email của kho bạc là đương nhiên rồi. Ngoài ra thì chúng tôi còn có những cái uh, mạng xã hội chẳng hạn như là Viber hoặc là Zalo. Tôi chúng tôi tranh thủ tất cả các phương tiện để có thể truyền thông ngay lập tức đến uh, các uh, công chức. Yes. So in the VST networks, we uh, use all of the means of communications. In addition to the official emails, we also use a lot of uh, uh, social uh, media and social networks like Viber or Zalo to communicate to all staff members of the network. Uh, cái giải pháp thứ ba mà chúng tôi đã áp dụng ấy, đó là bố trí công chức làm việc tại nhà thông qua một cái mạng uh, internet cũng như là tăng cường ứng dụng uh, công nghệ thông tin trong việc trao đổi thông tin. 
Uh, the third measures we adopt is that we allow civil servants and staff members to work from home via the internet, and we strengthen the ICT application for information exchanges. Cái giải pháp thứ tư là tạm thời chúng tôi cái này là cũng phạt từ chính phủ cũng như là kho bạc nhà nước là đã áp dụng luôn. Đó là tạm thời dừng cái việc triển khai kế hoạch thanh tra kiểm tra các uh, chuyến công tác cũng như các khóa đào tạo tập huấn các cuộc họp hội nghị mà chưa thực sự cấp bách. And uh, fourthly, uh, you know, this is a measure of the whole government and within the VSD, we temporarily suspended all inspections, supervisory missions, work missions, training events, seminars, workshops, and meetings that are considered not so urgent. Và cái uh, giải pháp mà thứ năm ấy đó là chính là làm thế nào để uh, bảo vệ cho công chức kho bạc cũng như là đảm bảo cái uh, hoạt động giao dịch bình thường thì chúng tôi đã đẩy mạnh cái giao dịch với khách hàng qua dịch vụ công trực tuyến. And uh, fifthly, uh, you know, for the protection of the VST staff members and uh, to uh, ensure business continuity, we strengthen online transactions. Còn cái cái biện pháp thứ sáu mà kho bạc đã triển khai ấy, thì nó, nó mang tính là hỗ trợ cũng tham gia cùng với cả xã hội Việt Nam nói chung đó là đóng góp và quyên góp ủng hộ cho cái phòng chống dịch. À, chúng tôi đã đóng góp được rất là nhiều cái tiền à, từ ngày lương của các cán bộ công chức cũng như là các quỹ để chuyển cho mặt trận tổ quốc ủng hộ cho các uh, gọi là yeah. and the fourth measures like many others we also appeal to uh, all civil servants and public employers and workers in the VST to donate uh, for uh, the pandemic prevention and control so we uh, mobilized uh, staff members to uh, uh, to use their salaries and we mobilize our own funds to uh, donate uh, through the Vietnam Fatherland Fund and the Red Cross uh, for the pandemic control. Chúng tôi, những người dân này thì cũng đóng góp gạo rồi là khẩu trang hoặc là thực phẩm mà đây là trực tiếp là để hỗ trợ cho tất cả những các bác sĩ hoặc là những người dân gặp khó khăn khác. This is uh, not us but also to citizens who also donated, you know, a mask or rice uh, to the doctors and to, uh, you know, uh, disadvantaged persons uh, in the fight against the pandemic. Uh, tôi nghĩ rằng là chắc là trên thế giới cũng đã đều nghe nói đến là ở Việt Nam thì cái trong cái phòng chống dịch cái chúng tôi có cái việc là uh, uh, test cho các uh, những người mà nghi nhiễm ấy là không thu phí. Uh, you know that uh, maybe you heard that in Vietnam we provide a free testing uh, for some suspected cases. Thế rồi là những uh, cán bộ mà ngành y tế, những cái người mà làm ở trong các khu cách ly chẳng hạn đấy thì rất vất vả thì đấy là những cái việc ủng hộ đóng góp của các công chức kho bạc cũng như người dân Việt Nam nói chung để hỗ trợ. Uh, we also have uh, you know health workers working in isolation uh, uh, camps for example. So uh, the citizens and the VST staff also try to donate to assist uh, these uh, persons and activities. Uh, bây giờ thì tôi sẽ xin uh, chuyển khai uh, chuyển sang nói nói về cái chỗ những cái nghiệp vụ chính có ba cái nghiệp chính ở trong chức năng chính của kho bạc thì kho bạc nhà nước đã làm như thế nào trong thời gian vừa qua? Uh, now I'd like to move on to uh, you know describe the situations in the three key functions of the treasury. What measures have you taken to, uh, in these uh, three key functions? Uh, thứ nhất đó là liên quan đến việc là kiểm soát các khoản chi ngân sách nhà nước. Uh, first I would like to talk about expenditure control functions. Trước đó thì chúng tôi có một cái, cái cái quy định về kiểm soát chi ở kho bạc và Việt Nam ấy thì nó cũng khác với cả nhiều nước khác trên thế giới cũng như là trong cái Penta. Uh, in Việt Nam we have a kind of regulations on expenditure controls that may be a little bit uh, you know different to uh, that in the other countries and uh, other members of Penta. Uh, và chúng tôi là liên tục thực hiện những cái cải cách thủ tục hành chính để hiện đại hóa quy trình và hướng đến một cái kho bạc số. So we continuously you know, conduct our administrative reform and business process modernization to aim at a digital treasury. Tháng 1 năm nay thì chúng tôi đã được có một cái nghị định là số 11 để quy định về cái thủ tục hành chính thuộc cả lĩnh vực kho bạc, các quy trình thủ tục được đơn giản hóa, rút ngắn thời gian kiểm soát và phân định rõ cái trách nhiệm quyền hạn của các cơ quan, các đơn vị trong thu chỉnh ngân sách. Uh, yes, so uh, in January this year, we promulgated uh, a decree uh, on the administrative procedures in the VSD domain uh, to simplify these procedures to, 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 to shorten the time for expenditure controls uh, and, uh, you know, uh, to have clear definition of responsibilities and powers of units uh, in the budget spending cycle. À, cái thứ hai là chúng tôi áp dụng cái nguyên tắc là thanh toán trước kiểm soát sau đối với hợp thanh toán nhiều lần. We also try to adopt the principles of exempt payment, ex-post control for the contracts with multiple payments. 
và chúng tôi cũng dần dần là thực hiện những kiểm soát chi theo rủi ro căn cứ vào giá trị của khoản chi. We also uh, you know phase in risk based expense controls on the basics of payment value. Thế còn uh, trong cái bối cảnh là có đại dịch Covid thì có những khoản chi uh, và những cái hoạt động chi uh, trong cái điều kiện là còn phải giãn cách xã hội cũng như là phải bảo vệ uh, cả người dân cũng như là công chức kho bạc thì chúng tôi đã có một số những cái biện pháp để thực hiện. And in the context of the COVID-19, uh, so we, we are supposed uh, to work under the social distancing uh, you know, uh, environment for the protection of the VSD staff members and the citizens. We have uh, you know, adopted some measures. Thứ nhất đó là đẩy mạnh cái triển, uh, triển khai dịch vụ công trực tuyến. Uh, first, uh, we try to strengthen online public service delivery. Có nghĩa là các uh, đơn vị uh, sử dụng ngân sách, các đơn vị giao dịch đó, sẽ giao dịch với kho bạc thông qua một cái phương thức giao dịch điện tử. Which means that uh, the spend units will have to transact with the treasury offices via online transactions. Uh, thứ hai là chúng tôi đã uh, chỉ đạo các uh, kho bạc địa phương là kiểm soát và kịp thời giải ngân quản lý dịch uh, COVID. We also requested the local treasury offices to uh, timely process uh, disbursements uh, and, uh, for COVID. Uh, Uh, you know, uh, controls. Và cái khoản chi này là ví dụ như là chi cho um, gọi là thành lập bệnh viện giá chiến này, chi hỗ trợ cho những cái bác sĩ y sĩ này, rồi là cho những cái người mà trong các khu cách ly mua các trang thiết bị. Uh, you know, uh, these expenditures are for the establishment of field hospitals uh, to support, you know, um, uh, doctors and health workers and uh, to spend for, you know, isolation in concentration. À, và cái uh, yêu cầu của kho bạc là cũng chỉ đạo các địa, các kho bạc địa phương ấy. Là... We also require the local treasury offices. Biết tắt như nào luôn. Không 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 nó, nó sẽ bị vang. Dùng cái này thôi. Dùng một cái thôi. Just now we can hear you. Right? Không giờ phải mở cái này ra đang ở trong chế độ là trình bày Mở to cái này ra không biết Ok, we are connected Excuse me, can you hear me? Welcome back. Yes, thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. So you can hear me. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes, I would like to uh, talk about the third point in the, uh, how to conduct expenditure controls under the context of the pandemic. So we have to request, uh, you know, constant reports on uh, the spending for pandemic prevention and controls uh, uh, to support the oversight of the government and uh, to support uh, the uh, VSD and the uh, MOF. Yes, I think that in the webinar of the B Corp, uh, Mr. Tan uh, uh, um, in the B Corp already presented uh, the government's uh, uh, relief package. Uh, like in the Philippines, we also have the relief package, uh, which is about 62 uh, trillion dollars, uh, equivalent to uh, 3 billion USD. Uh, so we target uh, seven groups. Uh, first, we support the workers having their employment contracts suspended or uh, those who have to take forced leaves. Uh, 
Uh, secondly, we provide support to household businesses having the turnovers of under 100 million VND per year. And then we provide support to the workers having their employment contracts terminated. And then we also support self-employed workers. And then support to revolutionary merited persons. They are supposed to the poor and near poor households. And supposed to social assistance policy merited groups. <coughs> so I think that throughout the social distancing period and now when it comes to the new normal, I think that the spending uh, disbursement from the state budgets uh, was, has been ensured without any uh, disruption. So what did you do in the state treasury on cash management operations? I would like to move on to the second topic, uh, uh, the, the impacts of COVID-19 on uh, cash management operations. Uh, the challenges and issues are like many other countries, including the Philippines and the Myanmar. Uh, the impacts on the state budgets and revenues are the same, you know, I mean, declining budget revenues and increasing budget spending. Uh, so uh, the Treasury had to take some urgent actions. First, we have to closely monitor state budget revenues and expenditure execution and report timely to the Ministry of Finance for cash management actions. Uh, within the VSD, we have to manage state-owned cash timely, actively, and flexibly to timely and fully meet the state budget payment requirements and in response to the VSD transaction units requirements. Oh, Nam, we can't hear so, you. Uh, at the so, uh, uh, we also have to uh, you know, embark on financing operations. Uh, in the uh, conference in Quảng Ninh in May 2019, we also presented to you that one of the functions of the VSD is uh, financing operations. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes. Okay. But we can only hear you, Nam. Uh, we cannot hear the presenter's voice. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there are some challenges and issues in financing operations, uh, you know, significant because of the significant impacts of the moderating macroeconomic outlooks. It raised concerns. Um, it also raised uh, government bond yields and making investors reluctant to invest in long-term government bonds. Uh, 
um, volatility in the financial and monetary markets induced reluctant sentiments among investors as they looked for safe haven, resulting in difficulties for government bond issuance. So the VSD had to take some actions in its financing operations. In quarter one, as the capital expenditure demand slowed down and uh, the cash balance uh, built up, the VSD actively restrained the volume of bonds to be issued to the market. Uh, which lower the unused amount of uh, finance proceeds, which might compromise uh, value uh, for money. But starting from mid-March, uh, the cash demand for the state budget picked up, so the VSD increased the volume of government bond issuance to increase state budget financing. We also propose to the Ministry of Finance to ask for the Vietnam's uh, you know, uh, security agency to participate in Vietnam in government bond oceans from quarter two. Uh, another action is that we had to collaborate with uh, many related agencies of the government to closely monitor the market uh, and the progress of disbursement for public investments as well as central government's uh, debt refinancing needs so as to arrange for relevant and focused uh, financings with emphasis on oceaning of government bonds for tenders of five years or more. Uh, 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 other core functions of the VSD is uh, um, accounting and reporting. You know, uh, actually, COVID-19 has some impacts on the accounting and reporting functions, uh, you know, um, uh, for the maintenance of business as the usual operations of the treasury uh, systems. Uh, you know, we, we had to allow some uh, staff members to uh, work uh, from home. Hmm. On the other hand, we have to maintain the continuity of uh, the VSD accounting systems like TAPMIS, the payment settlement systems, the state accounting general system. In addition, we also have to maintain the collection of revenues and collaboration with the banking system to ensure the collection of state budget revenues. Also, we have to provide timely reporting information to support the budget execution. Yes, so um, what I want to emphasize is that uh, with these requirements and with the impacts of COVID-19 you know, in Vietnam, in that context, we had to uh, practice social distancing. It means that uh, you know, uh, we restrain uh, you know, people to go out into the streets and people have to wear masks. <laughs> So as part of the uh, you know, uh, response actions, uh, we allow some staff members to work from home and to assess the VSD systems from distance. We also arrange for staff members to uh, take turns to work in shifts and roster uh, in the VSD offices to make sure that all payments, requests, and documents are timely and adequately processed.
and uh, the uh, units that are transacting with the VST also try to strengthen their use of online services. <coughs> so for all of new transactions relating to COVID, uh, for example, we consider them as uh, emerging accounting events. So we have, uh, you know, separate budget allocations for COVID uh, pandemic prevention and controls, for example, arranging for uh, examination and testing, uh, disinfection, uh, procurement of medical equipment, supplies, drugs, etc. Or support provided to uh, impacted enterprises and workers. So as I uh, described uh, for uh, expenditure controls, for example, the VSD sent a letter requesting all the provincial VSD offices uh, to be responsible for bookkeeping, accounting, reporting, and verification of actual budget spending for the prevention and control of COVID-19 with uh, detailed breakdowns into remuneration, procurement, repairs, construction of hospitals, etc. And we also have to provide, you know, timely data and reports to uh, inform relevant authorities at the district level, uh, provincial level, and central levels uh, for their effective uh, epidemic uh, prevention and control decisions. Uh, so we are, we are supposed to provide regular and hard reports. Uh, for, ad, for regular reports, we have uh, two periods per month on the 15th and month end date. Uh, so all of these, uh, you know, measures and actions require very good IT platforms, not only to support, you know, uh, 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 working from home, but also for smooth and efficient, uh, you know, communications and, and, and uh, transactions uh, via the uh, online platforms. Uh, that's why I would like to give floor to uh, Mr. Phuong to uh, present to you the rest of the presentation. Uh, tôi chỉ có mấy ý, uh, uh, về cái đảm bảo công nghệ thông tin cho việc uh, chi tiêu ngân sách trong cái giai đoạn uh, vừa qua, giai đoạn Covid vừa qua thì uh, uh, bên cạnh cái hệ thống uh, TAMIS mà chúng tôi triển khai trong cái uh, mạng uh, của ngành uh, tài chính thì chúng tôi có triển khai từ năm 2019 rồi thì có triển khai cái hệ thống dịch uh, vụ công trực tuyến để cho gần 100.000 đơn vị chi tiêu ngân sách có thể kết nối vào uh, so I just would like to share with you that uh, in terms of uh, having the IT platform to support uh, uh, budget expenditure payments uh, in addition to the TAPME systems uh, that are connected to all the uh, uh, finance offices and authorities. In 2019, we also developed uh, an e-portal for public service delivery uh, that, that are assessed by more than 100,000 spending units. <coughs> là đã sử dụng cái hệ thống dịch vụ công trực tuyến này để mà gửi các cái yêu cầu chi ngân sách và các hồ sơ bằng điện tử trong suốt thời gian Covid vừa qua. And about 80% of the spending units used the portal for public uh, service online, uh, delivery online. Uh, so they, they, they use the system to submit their payment request, instruction and supporting documents online. Thế và cái hệ thống uh, trực tuyến này của chúng tôi thì uh, tích hợp chặt chẽ với cả hệ thống co tamis và cái hệ thống kết nối với cả ngân hàng để thanh toán uh, điện tử đến uh, trực tiếp đến những cái đơn vị thủ hưởng. Uh, so uh, our online public service delivery portals are connected and linked to the core TAPMI systems and the banking uh, uh, systems uh, uh, so as to uh, apply uh, electronic payments. Uh, 
và như vậy là nó giúp cho các đơn vị sử dụng ngân sách là hoàn toàn có thể ngồi từ cơ quan hoặc ngồi từ nhà của họ để họ thực hiện các giao dịch điện tử về chi tiêu ngân sách. So with the uh, new uh, public s- online public service delivery portals, the spend units can uh, stay in the offices or even at home uh, to conduct uh, transactions uh, for uh, budget spending. And secondly, on the revenue side, the uh, Uh, we have uh, electronic uh, connections with the commercial banks and the central bank and uh, revenue agencies like uh, the tax departments, uh, customs department and other revenue authorities. Yes. So by now, about uh, 98 or 99 percent of the citizens and businesses can use the, the e-portal to pay tax uh, uh, and budget revenues uh, directly. Mm. And uh, the um, revenue uh, collection data are interfaced between the uh, banking systems and the uh, revenue authority system to the treasury systems. So we can have uh, you know, primary data for reporting to support uh, budget execution. Uh, and for cash management and e-payments, for example, we have been able to establish the uh, uh, treasury single accounts and we have the IT system to support uh, the uh, Treasury single accounts to operate efficiently. Uh, so uh, during the COVID pandemic, the treasury staffs can have access to the system uh, through the internet or uh, VPN uh, virtual uh, private network. And uh, for the local VST offices, uh, depending on the situation, you know, they can arrange for 50% of the staff members to work in office and uh, 50% to work from home. Bên cạnh đấy thì có chúng tôi cũng sử dụng các cái kênh các công cụ hỗ trợ cho cán bộ của hệ thống kho bạc nước có thể tổ chức họp trực tuyến bằng cái công nghệ của Microsoft Teams cũng như là sử dụng các cái kênh khác của mạng xã hội hoặc là những kênh và các phục vụ phương tiện khác. Uh, we also uh, uh, you know, um, used uh, some instruments to support uh, the uh, VST staff members. Uh, for, for example, for uh, video conference, we may use uh, Microsoft Teams and some other social media networks to, uh, to support uh, you know, meetings. Uh, với những công cụ hỗ trợ đấy thì chúng tôi thấy rằng là ở trong cái giai đoạn Covid vừa rồi thì đã chuyển đổi uh, được uh, cái, 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 các cái chức năng co function của kho, kho bạc cũng như là cái so with these tools, I think that uh, during the COVID-19, we made a transition in the core functions uh, of the VSTs and it's, uh, you know, more than a dozen thousands of staff members to a new uh, platform, you know, uh, uh, for the transition into uh, uh, the digital treasury. Uh, that's the, the end of our presentation. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for this very rich presentation. Uh, uh, I think mean, that's, that's uh, very comprehensive and really shows uh, how you managed to beat uh, COVID so effectively. Uh, I note really a couple of aspects. 
proactivity. Uh, I'm amazed that uh, on on January 23, uh, responses were were made to this. The COVID committee was set up, um, and I think that the second point I really note is effective coordination. It's true that the pandemic like this restrikes across the public private sector, all parts of society. And so it's only through effective coordination mechanism that it can be uh, addressed. And I think it's good to see that it was done at all levels of government, central government level, the local government level, within organizations, as we can see. Effective communication, uh, I think that was maybe another very important takeaway. Uh, and, and really two-way communication with proactively reaching out to, to uh, counterpart stakeholders, spending units about the needs, communication to the broader public, but also uh, communication technology and, and facilitating business continuity through home-based work and remote connectivity. So that's, that's great. And then maybe also the resilience of the response. So that's something which was quite useful, trying to see how um, maybe some of these good practices can be uh, continued further. But let me uh, maybe open up the floor uh, for questions. We have already received a few questions. <clears throat> One uh, from Indonesia, a uh, very relevant question about the government-wide response and the coordination between two key actors, which is really the Ministry of Finance and Treasury on one side, and then the central bank on the other side, and finding the right balance between fiscal response, monetary response. Uh, so that's, that's an important aspect. It would be great to hear uh, the different presenters, uh, the three countries, quickly on that point. So, uh, and any other PEMDA member countries that want to come in, in terms of what were the central bank measures and how, how did it uh, reinforce the treasury measures and how did treasury and central bank work together in fighting this crisis. And it's always a delicate balance between monetary policy and fiscal policy in this situation. So that's, that's maybe the first question, which I, I would address to all presenters. So whatever country you want to come in first, uh, let me know. So, so Ms. Dias, uh, can I volunteer you? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? In the Philippines. How did it work in the Philippines? So what, what did the central bank do and how did you, how did it uh, strengthen your own action? How did you coordinate your action? Well, one of the specific partnership that we had with uh, our central bank is we signed a uh, repo, um, MOA, with BSP for around 300 billion. And we are in close coordination with all the government financial institutions regarding their uh, liquidity situations and their ability to participate action so that we could address um, problems that they may encounter or liquidity infusion that they may thank, thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, so, so yeah, you mentioned, the, you mentioned the, the, the more active role in uh, in the financial sector, uh, the secondary markets, also buying back bonds. Uh, since you bought back bonds from state-owned banks to give them liquidity, which uh, is quite original, um, it shows a bit the extent of that crisis. Uh, other countries, I know, I know that Myanmar also had, uh, had a very short, close cooperation with the central bank, both in terms of helping to finance the deficit, while uh, uh, keeping that uh, limited to avoid inflationary pressures, uh, but also in terms of uh, the central bank liquidity injection in the in the private and financial sector. Mila, do you want to come to that point? We can hear you. Uh, yes, uh, we also have a good. Um, we also have a good really a good coordination with the Central Bank of Myanmar. So uh, we have an IMF loan from 700 billion uh, loan. It is also the we we we, we were uh, replenish our deficit. 
This is our right. coordination between Myanmar, uh, Central Bank of Myanmar and MOPF. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Vietnam, can you share your experience on that point? So in the context of the COVID-19, to provide liquidity for the spending units, we had to work closely with the central bank uh, to make sure that we have sufficient liquidity. What it did is that we fully sweep our cash balances into our accounts in the central bank. Also, we communicated uh, daily and regularly with the central banks on the monetary markets. Uh, to support the central bank's uh, monetary operations and in their inflation controls and exchange rate control. Uh, over. Thank you very much. And then a related question that was raised is, uh, and which is really core function of treasury, is cash management and debt management. I think it, it also involves a very close collaboration. <laughs> Uh, between uh, between different actors. So it was very interesting to hear from from different uh, um, member countries how they try to prioritize their cash since not only did the expenditures go down, but the, the sequencing, the profile of this expenditure, uh, of the income also uh, actually changed, right, with uh, uh, tax deferrals. On the expenditure side, we also saw from Viet Vietnam's presentation that uh, expenditures actually reduced in the first quarter, right? Because activity reduced, work stopped, but then really picked up uh, massively in the second quarter as all this economic relief and COVID responses uh, kicked in. So that's really very difficult uh, cash management. So it would be good to hear uh, maybe from the different countries on, on that point is how did they manage this transition and this debt management? And maybe also hear from Suhas uh, on that point in terms of what of this? Uh, what are the lessons learned, and what are maybe the good practices we can go, we can keep going forward in terms of broadening the single treasury account? Thank you. Thanks, Fabian. Uh, as we know, this is a time of crisis. So one of the most important things to know now is how much cash you have and where it is sitting. Which means, and we have already heard a lot on this from uh, countries like Vietnam. Uh, having a good treasury single account where the money is swept in periodically. There are other ways to do things. After all, there is monitoring of the cash and there is spending of the cash. And how are the line ministries and other agencies spending the money that they have? So there are various ways to do it, whether you have a centralized system of payment, which is very easy to do or easier to do when you have a good FMI system in place, maybe not so easy to do when you don't have some system like that. But sometimes it's easier to centralize payments and sometimes it is good to delegate, depends on the level of development of the country. So it's uh, more a management philosophy as uh, we were talking when Khurram was, was, was making his presentation. There is also important for the countries to monitor fluidity between different funds. There could be state funds, so you would have given money to states, but money could be sitting there doing nothing for a long time while you may be raising money elsewhere. So it's important to ensure that there is fluidity of cash between different funds, states, regional, own funds, whatever. That brings us to the next point of having a good cash forecasting system. Now, Ideally, it should be a daily system which has a lot of granularity, but that may not be possible for some countries. But at least a weekly monitoring of cash is very, very important to know where we are. And having a formal system of analysis. Now, there are two parts here. One is somebody is going to make a projection and somebody is going to make an analysis. There are two different functions. So. The cash management function has to be divided into projection, a group which does projection, and a group which done, does an analysis. Where did the money go? How did it go? How well was it spent? Should it be diverted somewhere else? That sort of analysis. 
basically the point is of course as all all of you know it's important to make sure money is not sitting around doing nothing so we need to keep keep monitoring that covid reporting becomes an additional strain on the system if the system is weak and in any case a lot of money being spent on covid so at some stage we are monitoring also what is being spent and how it is being spent and therefore since you are monitoring what is being spent you can also monitor how you can also report on that so reporting becomes very important and financial agents are also important how who are you banking with what are your banks what are your financial agents central bank other banks what are your arrangements with those banks how efficient are those arrangements that also needs to be looked at some of these may may be long term or medium term measures not long term medium term measures but it's important to not to waste this crisis and start thinking about these issues that would ultimately come up uh, also it is important to expand the d- domestic debt market i mean obviously raising money abroad is not going to be so easy for quite some time for the foreseeable future so how do we expand the domestic debt market of course it is important to also to check that you don't have a lot of balances sitting around doing nothing while you are raising money in the domestic debt market trying to encourage the market and as again vietnam's presentation pointed out it's important to focus on revenues revenue inflows will be declining that is for sure expenditures will be rising so the gap between incomes and expenditures is going to be a very sharp one for the for the foreseeable future which also means that good cash managers need to follow up constantly with the line ministries and spending agency and how the money is being spent and how efficiently it is being spent which is why that group of which does the analysis should be able to see this it also means there a lot more work for cash managers that they have been doing so far and uh, lastly don't, don't forget keep the bills because sure enough when the crisis is over audit will come around and ask for the bills and you should be able to find those bills when that time comes so as we are saying for covid keep washing your hands similarly for this for cash management keep sweeping washing hands and sweeping the money into the tsa so washing and sweeping are two most important things in our near future thank you thank thank you very much for us um, very, very inspiring indeed and that's my request to to the presenters uh, do you see an opportunity uh, through this crisis to expand your tsa right to have to keep some of these practices that were done in the emergency times but which are just good financial management practices and cash management practices um so it would be good to hear from you uh, maybe uh Diane, do you want to come in hello uh I, um, is my audio on hello yes yes we can hear you we yeah. can hear you okay well. um um The Philippines has been continually endeavoring to uh, expand the TSA. Even before the the COVID pandemic, we have been finding ways to communicate with uh, other agencies for them to sweep, especially those funds uh, uh, that are lodged in their dormant accounts. So um, whether there is COVID or not, the, the endeavor to expand or sweep this funds from the agency's funds that are dormant to the treasury single account has been continuous continuous for the treasury of the philippines thank you guys there's actually a follow up question uh, for you from pike pike uh, you mentioned about the decentralized uh, structure uh, of of financial management and disbursement uh, and so so what what are the lessons learned and improvements that could be done in that respect um and so did you have to change some of your regulations to be able to claw back some of these resources or maybe prioritize uh, the disbursement of these resources uh, well, uh, and and yeah okay so, yeah. so that's a, a question we had for you yeah um one of the challenges i think the main challenge in monitoring the centralized disbursement is being able to be sure uh that the funds really are received by the intended beneficiaries 
So uh, right now, again, we don't have the. We are not conducting any audit. So although all these bursements of national government or local government uh, units are still subject to the government accounting and audit principles, uh, we will see. We will find out eventually if we conduct the post audit if said funds really were received by the uh, beneficiaries and for intended projects. And also, um, I keep connecting to the, I keep on referring rather to the Bayanihan Act because we have a provision in this law which states that any local government or any uh, government official that is found out to, uh, to have in, been involved in any anomalous transaction, uh, let's say uh, reverting the fund to some other transactions that are in, that's not intended for it, will be subject to criminal and administrative uh, cases or penalties. So again, uh, monitoring would be very challenging to, fi to really find out if the, the funds were really used for the intended project and the beneficiaries. I think one other question is that what is the I'm sorry I, I'm, can I proceed yeah okay so one of the other question is what main actions have been responded urgently by the treasury one of the action is um, making sure that there is cash there is fund uh, we can fund the emergency requirement of the, the government so we have we do uh, weekly cash flow meetings there is a team that is involved in these uh, cash flow uh, projections. They have uh, a minimum of two uh, scenarios, cash flow scenarios, and we monitor our treasury single account because it's lodged in the uh, uh, central bank, and we have this daily statement of account. So we monitor inflows and outflows, and we do frequent cash flow uh, analysis and presentations to the management. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. We also had a question from uh, Rushdi Ahmad from Malaysia. Uh, please come in. Hello, good morning. Okay, I, even though the name is Rushdi, but my name is Salmia. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm from Malaysia, from Accountant General's Department. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, uh, give uh, uh, a big uh, clap to everybody, the presenters. Uh, but based on the presentation that from the various country, I mean, uh, in Malaysia, we have actually, uh, I, I would like to share the experience of Malaysia. Basically, most of the uh, things or steps taken by the countries have uh, Malaysia also implemented. Uh, as you know, Malaysia start uh, the, uh, what you call that MCO, uh, movement control order is actually uh, quite a bit late. Uh, compared to uh, Vietnam, which is for uh, January, but Malaysia start uh, uh, 18 of March. Uh, but uh, 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 today is actually the six, 66 days of the MCOs. So we are uh, is, uh, try. Uh, we are uh, a little bit uh, open up our business already. As you know, Malaysia also give uh, what we call that uh, stimulus economic package, uh, which is mounted about uh, 250 billion. Uh, equivalent to um, almost 58 billion USD. So actually, basically, uh, Malaysia, what we did is actually we given it to three uh, objectives actually to uh, help to protect the uh, people, meaning the rakyat, uh, second, to support the business and to strengthen the economy. Uh, uh, and, and then, uh, uh, as I would uh, agree and concur with um, uh, Shuhan, that as earlier stated, uh, Suhas, meaning that we have to monitor our uh, cash flow uh, regularly. In fact, in Malaysia, we do it every uh, daily as well as weekly. Uh, and then we also raise uh, the, uh, uh, in terms of uh, cash uh, 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 issuance, in terms of treasury bills, which is as confined to the local market. I mean, domestic market. Uh, we do not actually rely on uh, external uh, 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 parties. And, and then, uh, and also, um, actually, uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the services, uh, we are lucky because we have a centralized system. So meaning that all the payments uh, is actually, there is no uh, interruption, but we have some challenge in terms of revenues. Uh, because revenues, we have a, a, what you call that a separate um, 
or over the counters. So actually, there is a room for improvement in order to make sure that the revenue uh, that uh, comes in is actually through online, because uh, uh, mostly most of, especially our income tax uh, and then our customs, right? So they open up the counters. So there is a little bit impact on that. But basically, in Malaysia, we are managing uh, 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 quite well in that terms. So, so I, uh, uh, Fabian, uh, that is what I want. We would like to share the experience of Malaysia. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution. And mm. indeed, uh, Malaysia's response was massive uh, and, and impressive. Um, we also had yesterday a very interesting webinar where the chair of Kazana shared the role of state owned enterprises uh, in the response and a very seamless coordination between the Ministry of Finance, uh, state owned enterprises, and the private sector. And so it's true that a crisis of this magnitude really uh, requires a concerted effort. I think maybe one, one thing to also think about for treasuries as we go forward is that this crisis will leave some scars, uh, and notably in terms of fiscal risks and liability, which are also mounting in the parastatal uh, SOE sector, mm -hmm. and which uh, treasuries and Ministry of Finance also need, need to keep track uh, of, right, and try to mitigate to the extent possible. Uh, I know that now we're in the response mode, but uh, you know, we need to ask to uh, keep the receipts, is also keep track, not just of your cash, but also of your liabilities. Uh, yeah. That All right, okay. Thank you. So, so, sorry, uh, I think I thought maybe disconnected uh, in, in three minutes. Uh, so, for, for those who will be disconnected, I can move to WebEx. Does everyone have WebEx? So, because we, we had booked for three hours, but uh, I'm not quite sure what, what will happen. So, but uh, in, anyway, so maybe just uh, in, as, as the risk mitigation measure, then uh, let me hand over uh, to uh, Dr. Hill, the head of the Secretariat, for her remarks. And if we do manage to get an, an extension, then we can pursue the conversation. Thank you. Dr. Ho? Dr. Ho? Thank you, Fabian. Um, I hope we have, we had, I wish we had more time today, but yeah. Um, good morning, everyone. And um, due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 or the PAMNA meetings, so far was canceled this year. So offline meeting is quite limited now, but however, the need for peer learning is rather increasing in this time of emergency. I believe today's webinar is a very meaningful opportunity for all the participants. Uh, government should introduce best measures to tackle COVID-19 and to recover economic damage. But appropriate knowledge and information are not just out there. So I believe today's webinar provides lots of um, information and knowledge and experience to each other and hope this kind of all this information is very helpful. Um, as you all know, this webinar was organized in such a short notice. Without help of member countries, this meeting would have been very different. There are many people that made this webinar uh, very remarkable and meaningful. Uh, on behalf of PEMNA member countries, I would like to thank Mr. Dang Thi Thuy from Vietnam for opening this webinar with a warm welcome and inspiring comment. And I would like to thank Mr. Farouk from World Bank for suggesting good guidance and guidelines on the core function of Treasury in the time of this pandemic. I'd like to thank presenters from Myanmar, Philippines and Vietnam for sharing your experience and knowledge. This, that is quite helpful for all other member countries which are going through similar pathways. Thank you very much for all the presenters for your excellent presentations. We are very grateful to all the participants. I know this is the time of emergency and your every minute is very um very important at this time. So your insightful questions and active discussions made this webinar more lively and practical. Our thanks goes to um, Mr. Fabian Sidera, TICA facilitator for all his excellent effort on organizing and facilitating this meeting. Uh, we have some blackout today, but <laughs> I think we um, are coping 
very well. And hope you have found something helpful in the webinar that you could take to your work and your country. You could share with your colleagues from today's learning and lessons at the webinar. Um, please stay healthy and connected and keep washing your hands and keep up with your good working. Thank you very much and I hope to see you again very soon. Thank you very much, Dr. Ho, and uh, let me also extend my thanks to uh, all the PEMDA members, to the PEMDA experts for organizing this webinar. Uh, we were missing each other as we couldn't meet, so at least we can do that virtually. And uh, maybe we could have a, a, a future session also on the next phase, which is the recovery and how ministries of finance can contribute to make this recovery actually greener and better and mitigate another important risk around the corner, which is the climate risk. But uh, with that, and given that our time of connectivity is up, thank you very much, and uh, uh, let's stay in touch. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, Mrs. Thuy, would like to ask uh, maybe to the Secretariat about the plenary meeting. Are you going to organize the plenary meeting? Uh, we don't, we can't comment, we don't know yet. There's uh. So we'll keep you updated on that. We'll get back to you with the updates if there is any. But at this moment, we don't have any updates. And actually, uh, the secretary has a quick announcement to make before we let you go today. So we will be circulating the post-event uh, post sur evaluation survey after this webinar. And we would really appreciate if you could uh, reply, reply us back with the answers. If you could fill out the survey. And secondly, all the meeting materials, such as the agenda, presentations, and the meeting summaries, and as well as the recordings of this full webinar, will be available in our website. And we'll be posting that in our Facebook, and in turn, on the, I'm loading that in the, on our website as well. So we'll keep you updated on that as well. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.